Good morning. To open this morning's program, we would like to acknowledge that the lands we are gathering on today are the original homelands of the Nam Keg tribe, part of the Massachusetts tribal people. They are the original inhabitants that the English invaders first encountered in what is now the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Against all odds, descendants continue to survive and retain their oral and cultural traditions. Good morning, everybody. My name is Casey Sword. I'm, I'm the executive director here at the Cabot Theater. I'm just here to welcome you uh, to this beautiful theater. Uh, it's been here for almost 99 years uh, as a theater, which is a pretty incredible feat, uh, considering back in the 1970s, there were over 20,000 of these theaters, and most of them hit, hit the wrecking ball due to a variety of factors. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have this beautiful uh, historic asset here in Beverly. And even five years ago, the theater was closed, uh, and it was being shown to developers. And uh, we, we were lucky enough to live in such a wonderful community that a, a group of community members got together and formed a nonprofit. And I was lucky enough to have been selected to lead it. So here we are five years later. Uh, the Cabot Theater is alive uh, and hosting uh, for the second time uh, the, the Arts and Culture Summit for Essex County, which we're honored to do. Um, and it's been just an amazing uh, couple of years watching uh, the, the creative community here in Essex County come together. Uh, the, the partnerships and collaborations that have been formed as a result of this initiative have been amazing. Uh, the murals that uh, now exist on the Cabot Theater wouldn't have been here without this uh, partnership. And there are so many stories that you're going to hear today uh, about wonderful partnerships collaborations, organizations, artists that have all come together to make Essex County uh, a much better place to live and work uh, and run a business. So um, we thank you all for being here to the Cabot, uh, being at the Cabot today. Um, we hope maybe you will, of you will come back tonight for Big Bad Voodoo Daddy because we'll be flipping the room after this uh, for a great show tonight. Um, so enjoy the, enjoy the session uh, and enjoy the theater and thank you so much for being here. Please welcome Jonathan Payson, who is a wonderful friend to the Cabot, uh, Root, uh, ECCF, many wonderful organizations here on the North Shore. He is the chairman of the board at ECCF. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you, folks. Thank you all for coming here this morning. And most importantly, uh, I want to thank Casey. Um, normally, uh, you know, you just run through this whole long list of people to thank, but I have to stop to say, First of all, he is a really good guy, and many of you will know him, and those of you who don't should get to know him. Uh, he's a creative force in his own right. Um, this venue that we have for our uh, second, uh, our biennial uh, art summit is uh, through the um, uh, resources and the uh, generosity of the Cabot. Um, the board of directors there, we deserve, uh, they deserve thanks as well. Uh, and I hope you appreciate this as a, both a cultural and artistic uh, resource here in the county. It's really emblematic of what uh, we're trying to achieve with the um, Creative County Initiative. And uh, so uh, I'd like to thank Casey and the Cabot and their board of directors as well. So two years ago I stood up here and um, uh, mostly in jest, I said that uh, my, my hope and my uh, objective for the Creative County Initiative was that if we succeeded, ultimately it would be visible from space. And uh, two years on, um, I, I'm not kidding anymore. <laughs> uh, we're not there yet, uh, it, but we will shortly be looking for the name of an astronaut uh, or somebody who knows one who can take the picture with their cell phone out the window of the space station going over Essex County because we will indeed be uh, visible from space and it will be through the work of many of the people in this room uh, in partnership with the Barr Foundation and Essex County Community Foundation that we would do that. Our board, uh, when we first looked at this uh, project, it was uh, new ground for us. Um, and I give them a lot of credit as well. Many of them are in the room today, and, uh, and I hope you'll take an opportunity to speak with them um, and share your views. Uh, we've been on quite a learning journey ourselves, and certainly I have uh, personally, but they have gotten behind this project and this work 110%. Uh, 
Um, and I'm extraordinarily grateful for their support and their vision uh, and their contributions in so many ways to this project. And then our steering committee, of which Casey is uh, one member. Uh, we got a group of people together from the arts, cultural, municipal uh, sectors, state, local uh, level, um, to help design this project. Uh, and I think we thought they were done, um, and they said after they designed it that we're not leaving. Uh, and so 24 months later, virtually monthly meetings, and, uh, and some even more than that, uh, we still have that steering committee working with us, and uh, great news, as you'll hear later on, um, they may not even know it, but they've signed on for another three years. So uh, it's really quite a lot of generosity from people who already had uh, day jobs in a variety of places. Um, one of the uh, most powerful features of Creative County, in my mind, as I've uh, come to learn more about it, is the power of arts and culture. I know if, if you're here, you probably already know this, but it was a learning experience, an epiphany for me, how public art projects, uh, cultural mapping and uh, cultural engagement drive economic development. They draw people together, people begin to see Essex County, which is an extraordinary place in a very different uh, perspective, and uh, lo and behold, it creates this synergy and it creates this energy uh, and this discovery that, uh, that wouldn't have existed. Um, I give tremendous credit to Barr Foundation for appreciating the latent energy and creativity that was available and that existed across the county but needed to be unlocked. And in our partnership with them, I think we've begun to tap that, uh, but there's more there and you'll hear about it uh, through, the, uh, through the course of the day. I want to thank all of our municipal and business partners and the funders, the philanthropists in Essex County who have supported this project thus far. Uh, we continue to come out and count on your support and engagement uh, as we move forward, and I hope people in this room will reach out to more members of all three of those sectors of the county, uh, because this is going to be a much bigger and much more powerful project as a result of their collaboration. Um, this room is full of people from the arts community, from the funder community, from the business community, uh, from the nonprofit sector more broadly. Um, and we have a new face uh, among us as well today, and a really important one uh, that will be, I think, and I hope, a big part of uh, the work that goes on over the next three years. Um, he is the new uh, Ike and Rosemary uh, Van Otterloo um, uh, CEO of the Peabody Essex Museums. Uh, his name is Brian Kennedy, and, and Brian, if you could just stand up for a minute. Um, We'd like to welcome him to Essex County. Uh, originally from Ireland, he comes to us uh, from Toledo, and he is now a proud resident of uh, Salem, Massachusetts. So uh, welcome, um, and uh, we do very much look forward to getting to know you personally. His reputation for outreach and engagement in the community precedes him. Uh, and it's going to be a powerful uh, and welcome uh, source of energy and commitment from the PEM uh, to what's going on uh, at Creative County. I mentioned before the Barr Foundation and their own vision, uh, and they have been positively instrumental not only in getting Creative uh, County, the Creative County Initiative going, uh, in funding uh, a good deal of our work, but also in providing support resources and opportunities for us to learn more about how to do this successfully. And uh, God bless them, um, it, they've helped us a tremendous amount and I feel like we've been pretty successful so far. Um, but now there's more to talk about and more to do. And so I'm very happy to introduce Sun Song Wong, uh, who's the Director of Arts and Creativity at the Barr Foundation to share some additional thoughts and observations with you. Sun Song? Good morning, everyone. Oops. Thank you, John and Casey. And I really want to appreciate John.
for all of the shared values that we have specifically around learning and the kind of humbleness that he exhibits in terms of his learning process and all of the processes that we've engaged in together. So it's my great pleasure to be here for the second Essex County Art Summit. So if you were here last year, please stand up. This is amazing, thank you. Um, it's amazing to me that the tremendous energy in this room now is just the tip of the Essex County creative iceberg. We're here because we all believe that great art transforms the way we view and interact with the world. In these divisive times, we believe that artists and the arts are more critical than ever. As truth tellers, society's conscience and bridge builders. Arts and creativity have the power to connect us with each other, to help us understand our changing environment, and to imagine new, better, and different futures. Arts bring beauty into our lives. Over the last two years, Essex County Community Foundation's Creative County Initiative has sparked our imagination about more vibrant, equitable, and hope-filled communities. The overarching goal of BARS Arts and Creativity Program is to elevate the arts and enable creative expression to engage and inspire dynamic, thriving Massachusetts. We do this by investing in bold ideas and bold leaders. Before 2016, BAR did most of its grant making only in Boston. When our trustees endorsed a new strategy to invest in the arts across the state, we knew that we couldn't do that by ourselves and that we needed local partners with trusted relationships, the credibility and firsthand knowledge of the people, assets, and opportunities in these communities. We viewed community foundations as the ideal partners in this work, and we're thrilled to have found partners that are not only capable, but who are passionate, caring, visionary civic leaders. We've learned a great deal from our partnership with John, Beth, Karen, Stratton, your community advisors, your board members, and the entire community foundation team. Our four other community foundation partners are also working in allied ways in their local context. They're in Greater Worcester, Western Mass, the Berkshire Taconic region, and Southeastern Mass. Together with Essex County, these are the five regions that compose the Creative Commonwealth Initiative. And together, we've learned what it takes to make transformative investments. Helping regions tap the full potential of arts and creativity as a means to human, community, and economic development is work that requires time, a collective vision, and a holistic approach. This is precisely why BAR has extended our partnership to be over a 10-year period rather than six years with all of our community foundation partners. Essex County Community Foundation has a keen understanding of the collaboration, community investment, and time required to affect social change. Anchored in systems philanthropy, their approach recognizes that long-term impact stems from grassroots engagement, strategic partnerships, and funder participation. As evidenced by this amazing turnout, all of you that came back for another round, and all of you who are new, we welcome you. And particularly because of the breadth of backgrounds, sectors, and interests represented in this room today, the Community Foundation we see is playing an increasingly vital role as a regional convener and champion of artists and arts organizations. And it's exciting for us at BAR to invest in the evolution of the work and impact. So our experience at BAR informs our perspective that vibrant communities hold arts and creativity as core to their identity and culture. Best Team approaches its work and its collaboration with all of you through a systems lens that is broad and strategic. It meshes with Barr's view that a magnetic, enduring arts ecosystem must firstly nurture an art sector that is sustainable, diverse, innovative, and relevant. Artists need agency, Arts organizations need capacity, 
and diverse communities need access and welcome. Second, we, me we must engage allied sectors, particularly entities involved in community and economic development, helping them infuse arts and creative processes and their goals in their goals in their work. We must activate existing and new philanthropic supports for the arts with giving that is both strategic and collaborative. And lastly, we must inspire public leaders and all community members to be advocates for the arts, including providing supportive policies and funds. So this alignment of vision is why I'm so happy to be here with you all today. Today, I hope you will find the inspiration, knowledge, strategies, and new friendships that will help you realize your ambitious plans. We at BAR applaud your work, your energy, your willingness to take risk, to pursue growth and change in the years ahead. We look forward to learning with you as you've done so ably over the last few years as you discover and pursue new ways to enrich and embrace all the members of your community through arts and creativity. Thank you. Good morning. So thank you, Sansan San and John and Casey for your wonderful welcomes. Uh, let's see if I can tighten this up a little bit. Okay. Um, and a special thanks to the John Hyde Trio for the music this morning. And to Claudia Parashev, who's been capturing our silhouettes in the lobby. She'll be at Dane Street Church as well. Most of all, thank you all for being here at our second Essex County Arts and Culture Summit. You are in for a treat today. I recently saw a quote by Dan Rather. You probably saw it too if you're on Facebook like I am. Uh, he said, somewhere amid the darkness, a painter measures a blank canvas, a poet tests a line aloud, a songwriter brings a melody into tune. Art inspires, provokes thought, reflects beauty and pain. I seek it out even more in these times, and in so doing, I find hope in the human spirit. We need art in our lives today more than ever. I think of the millions of protesters in Hong Kong united by a new anthem about democracy written by a 20-year-old songwriter. And I think of the artists who projected the words of Greta Thunberg onto the 30-story UN building, which said, everything needs to change and it has to start today. The arts bring us together, show us our common ground, and give life and soul to our communities. And yes, the arts give us hope in the human spirit. Think about the power of that statement and what our lives would be without that hope. Then why do artists, poets, musicians, actors so often lack funding for their creative work? Why do our cultural nonprofits struggle to make ends meet? Why are arts the first to be cut from school budgets? We all feel the loss when a local theater closes or young creatives leave town for more affordable rents. On the other hand, we all feel the energy and joy when we're united by an artwork or performance that's well supported. We're here to build that support. Two years ago, as you heard, the Bar Foundation partnered with us five community foundations to strengthen this sector in Massachusetts. This was a first for ECCF and the first time for Bar to invest in a significant way outside Boston. What an opportunity this is and what a road it has been to lay the groundwork in these first two years. I'm gonna recap our work so far and map out the road ahead, but I want you to walk away today with understanding a bold concept. The work and impact of the Creative County Initiative is about systems. You heard that from Sansan. San. It's about strengthening the ecosystem so that arts and culture can grow and thrive. The Community Foundation connects and convenes and provides the glue that the creative sector has been missing. This work is rooted not in specific programs or events, but in the systems that make them possible. We think about it like an underground irrigation system that you don't see, but is essential for the crops and plants to prosper above ground. Our approach in Creative County Initiative is engaging the community first and foremost, looking for the root causes of what works and what doesn't work, keeping, uh, inspiring collaboration and collective action across all sectors, investing in larger resources to support the work over time, 
and engaging funders as strategic planners along the way. This is a far cry from what we in the creative sector have been able to do on our own. During our early planning work, we set out to identify the greatest challenges to the creative community. These were the basic needs. Connection across the region, connection to more people, and connection to all parts of our communities. Expanded resources so that artists can be paid and have affordable spaces to do their work. Education and training to build capacity for stronger arts organizations and to learn how to better collaborate with those not necessarily in the arts. More art in public spaces for greater access and engagement. Knowing these challenges, we designed a two-year pilot initiative invested in four key areas. The first was last year's Arts and Culture Summit, which was an amazing convening of many of you in this creative ecosystem. 400 of us came together for the first time. We were inspired by what this new funding could do, and we learned about ways to design collaborative creative placemaking projects and why cultural planning is vital to communities. We learned how we could share, better share resources and audiences with a new online calendar. We began at, at that time to form a broader, deeper creative web across Essex County. Next, we launched Essex County Creates, the regional online arts calendar and platform. Joining 50 other regions across the country that use the Artsopolis platform, we now connect and promote over 300 arts and culture venues, organizations, individual artists, right here in our region, north of Boston. Over 2,000 events over the past year have been posted and shared, and it's quickly becoming the go-to arts calendar for the public. And it's getting better. There are improvements, um, just to, in a quick FYI, there are improvements underway uh, that should be in place now so that it's a, a more usable, user-friendly uh, platform to upload your events. So check it out next time you go in. Uh, next, we supported cultural planning for our cities and towns to see how they can support the culture of their communities doing what they do best. We partnered with the two regional planning agencies to build deeper relationships with our municipal leaders. In four sub-regional workshops, we introduced cultural planning strategies to 125 attendees from all of our cities and towns who are now thinking differently about what they can do to protect, to protect and strengthen their cultural assets. Coming out of those workshops, we're now mapping the cultural assets of the Merrimack Valley's 15 cities and towns. This is a grassroots effort to identify the things that make us want to live, work, play, put down roots, and essentially what makes us feel like we belong in our communities. This asset mapping work will include the rest of Essex County communities over the next three years. And to round out our initiative, the fourth strategy was in grants to demonstrate the collective impact of cross-sector work. We invested $300,000 in 12 public art and placemaking grants across the county, selected from 43 applications. Many were ideas incubated right here at last year's summit. Hundreds of new partners worked together on these projects and tens of thousands in ad additional funding was raised to support them. In these projects, arts, culture, municipal, and business partners worked together in the public eye in 12 different ways to raise the visibility and appreciation for all arts and culture in our region. And look what they have inspired. We thank the Van Ness Creative Group for who was our partner for this video. I think it's amazing. I like it. It's definitely bringing people out. It's a topic of conversation. I love artwork on buildings. Walking out here and seeing everything, it was just like, yeah. wow. Arts and culture is just vital to uh, a vibrant city. All too often, I think the arts are viewed as sort of the frosting on the cake. In reality, they're an essential part of the cake itself. It was truly a gift from the Bar Foundation to say, you know, craft what you think is needed in your community. It makes people proud of the city. A pride of places is a really important piece. You know, we're just sort of a hollow shell 
if we don't have that life and soul that the arts bring. Art really does inspire us and culture really does ground us to our communities and creativity is really where the innovation happens. I like what ECCF is doing in terms of their collaborative work. It's brought together so many different organizations. We spent a lot of time thinking about individuals that we wanted around this table that could help design an initiative that would have real meaning and impact. They're the ones that have been bold and vision setting in this. That seems to resonate with donors. They like that they're part of something bigger, that they're dealing and funding around root cause issues. I think it would be lost to say that this is just an Essex County Community Foundation or a Bar Foundation initiative. It truly is grassroots and has come from the community itself. We found that there is a little bit of that secret sauce when you get government leaders, community groups, residents, funders all together for one shared goal. You can get stuff done. Dad is Native American and he wanted to show me all the stuff they do. The largest response we get is that I didn't know Native Americans still existed or I didn't know that that's what you did or looked like that are related to only seeing stereotypical imagery. This has been one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. I think every kid should have a chance to build a boat. And my experience in the past with this kind of thing is they are very proud of what they did afterwards. It's public health, it's public safety, it's so many different things that come together in a really beautiful and a unique way that I don't think Lawrence has really seen. This could grow into something really big and businesses, particularly around downtown, sort of spark the interest. Going through the grant application process with ECCF allowed us to do a pop-up test-up run of Curious City. Our first 10 weeks of operation being only open four days a week for the public, we had over 4,300 visitors. So yes, there is a need for a children's museum on the North Shore. All Southern American countries. I was Haiti, I studied diplomacy. It was interviewing over 100 immigrants. Some of the people were walking down the alleys of the Point neighborhood saying, I have never come to this neighborhood before. It's a concrete canvas, a landscape intervention and sculptural element in and of itself. I guess the long-term vision would have this park full of art, full of sculpture, just a lot of little kids running around skateboarding. One of the events that was really great was traveling accordion. The accordion around the world is used in, in very different ways, right? So she brought us musicians uh, from various countries to explore this common thread among different countries. Crossing Water is a week-long arts festival between Beverly and Salem, on, in, around, under the Beverly-Salem Bridge. In the last six months since we received the grant, we've met more people. We're just more connected to the North Shore than we've ever been. And I had never heard of tape art before, and that's new. And I thought, how cool is that? Because everybody's creative, even though they don't think they are. It's kind of this common thread in humanity that the arts makes us a more civilized place. Art's a necessary thing for us to have in order to have a really strong quality of life here in the region. But it's the aftermath of what happens. It's the fact that those entities came together for this project, and now they're talking about new and innovative ways to do things in their community. We often ignore that connection between long-term economic growth and short-term events. But if you can build on those events and have events every year, then that can really grow the economic base of the community. We have, through an impact study, seen businesses stating that they've seen a lot more revenue. Without the Creative County Initiative, Curious City would not have happened this year. ECCF allowed this to happen. This partnership with the Cabot would not have happened without the Essex County Community Foundation. Everybody has just worked so hard and there's been so much enthusiasm. And their support has been wonderful. These are things that uh, we don't really get. We haven't really had. They've been cheerleaders and supporters. What the foundation is doing is absolutely a, a model that I think can scale nationally. We actually have a neighbor on Judson Street who was so excited about it that he put public art on his house. We seem to light a fire and that fire grew pretty fast. If we can strengthen the ecosystem of arts, culture, and creativity in the county, we can really have a significant impact and be a game changer in creating more vibrant Essex County. This event was amazing. To view art 
inside or outside is enriching. And not only that, this art is free. I'm glad I came. It's so cool. Overall, it was just a really good experience to have. It's phenomenal. It's, you know, revitalizing the city. I think it's a great way to bring the community together. We would absolutely love to have more of these kinds of events in a regular, you know, throughout the year, all over the area. Yeah. That's what it's all about. So these projects are not just about the amazing, beautiful illumination of towers and bridges and waterways. The art itself performs in so many ways that are critically important to our communities. The art bridges cultural divides and creates stronger bonds among the people and businesses who share those communities. The art of activating a public space in a new way, like the Beverly Salem Bridge, inspires groups of dancers, poets, marching bands, and artisans to share their art for more of us to experience. These projects are not just about interesting stories in tape or stunning images on walls. These murals projects make, a, make us all aware of how public art connects us to our history, heritage, public spaces, and to each other. These projects connected entire towns and arts organizations, and they give the bold statement that we are an important place and we are held up and supported by the community. The projects are not just for entertainment. By reimagining public spaces like the new parklets in Lynn, people come together, learn about each other, and find their communities, their commonalities. By experiencing the magical laser and sound collage of I Am Migration, people from multiple cultures connected their immigration stories rooted over many years in one Salem neighborhood. The projects aren't simply about creating a kids' museum or a skate park or a mural on a library. The work acts to foster creativity and innovation in our next generation of leaders, artists, and entrepreneurs. And the projects give our youth and young creatives a sense of belonging in and investment by their hometowns. These projects aren't just about new ways to present and sell art, as critically important as that is. Artist shanties give us a new way of thinking about artist colonies in our rapidly, rapidly gentrifying waterfront towns. A different way to make sure that artists can work in proximity, share creative ideas, and experience the power of we. These projects aren't just about the extraordinary dancing, drumming, and singing of our original people. Through the art, we celebrated with our Native American Awareness Group to expand its reach and expand our awareness of historical truths and traditions in three powwows across the county. These projects are not just about the boats or the baskets. When these young guys felled the tree, planed the wood, and built and launched this traditional clamming skiff in Essex, it forever changed their lives. This is the work of the Creative County Initiative. These 12 inaugural projects were more than the tremendous art and artisanry of the grantees. It's what the art inspired, who the art connected, and the communities that were transformed by the art itself. Each one made creative work more visible, more valued, and more supported by the business philanthropic, and town leaders of the host communities. And each one taught us where to invest in the future, what systems of people, funding, and leadership work to make these things possible. And finally, and critically important, this work has not only delivered great artwork, but has inspired deeper investment across the county. Last year, ECCF raised over $250,000 in new funding for the arts. Many of you are in the room, and we thank you. When combined with BAR's $500,000 grant, we've, we saw a $750,000 investment in arts and culture across the county. ECCF understands the need for new systems of funding, which is on the road ahead. 
I'm so excited to announce with all of us today that based on the work of the last two years, the Barr Foundation is continuing their leadership in this work. ECCF will receive a million dollars for the next phase of Creative County Initiative. It's a phase of growth and change over the next three years, 2020 to 2022. And ECCF will raise an additional $300,000 at least to collectively invest a new 1.3 million to expand our impact. Here's where this investment will impact you and your community. Beginning in 2020, there will be more collaborative public art and placemaking projects and new funding for accelerator grants to launch or test innovative creative projects or partnerships. Now that you're all part of the Creative County web, you'll know later on this year when, that, when the grant applications are open. They will be open by January 1st. Uh, continued work in cultural planning, beginning with mapping the region's art, arts and cultural assets. Communications will continue to develop key, consistent messaging of the long-term outcomes of a healthy ecosystem. And we'll continue to make Essex County Creates a robust communications hub for all of us capacity building for artists and cultural nonprofits to be stronger in financial management, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, marketing, audience engagement, and other key areas. And convenings like this one and Think Labs to develop better systems to fund the arts, develop creative spaces, train arts leaders, and support creative businesses. This million dollar investment by the Barr Foundation is truly new, you know, news truly hot off the press. Just days ago, we thank Barr and ECCF donors who collectively have committed more than $2 million over this five year time period in support of arts and culture. As we finish our two year pilot initiative in the coming months and we put the final touches on our next three year strategy, we hope you leave inspired to connect with us and engage in the Creative County Initiative. We need you. We need your ideas, your voice, and your participation. Think of all we've accomplished in two short years and what that means for our collective future. This is the time to make yourself known and be part of the Essex County Creative Web. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jason Schupack, one of the founders of NEA's Our Town Grant Program and a true pioneer in the field of creative placemaking. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, Jason. Uh, I'm so happy to, ooh, hot mic. I'm so happy to be home uh, back in Massachusetts. I lived here a really long time. Um, and I'm happy to tell you guys today a little bit of a story about creative placemaking, and it's a story in three parts. Um, so before I get into that story, I want to just say that a lot of this originated at the National Endowment for the Arts, who goes with the National for the arts is. Okay, yeah, round of applause for the National Endowment for the Arts, awesome, yeah. Okay, Okay. so you know what it is, what is it? This is interactive, what is it? Someone, call. anybody know what it is? It gives money to the arts, yes, but what actually is it? Right, it's federal government, right? It is actually a federal government agency. I'm here from the federal government and I'm here to help. I used to love to say that. Um, <laughs> always a great laugh line. Okay, so this story is a story of us. It's a story of all of us and what happened to us since 2008. It's a story of nonprofits, for profits, and the government coming together to build better communities across the country. Okay, so the story of us. What happened in 2008? Anybody remember? The Great Recession, right. Remember those jerks at the bank? We all love them. Um, okay, so what happened? What was the major problem in the little secret of the screen? What happened? Housing, right? And what happened with housing is that we are all underwater on our mortgages. So what does it mean to be underwater on our mortgage? We've got a... We've got a you're just like one of the kids in my class who's like sits in the front row. I love it. Just like they're all, I know, I know. Um, uh, yes, if you're underwater on your mortgage, it means that your house is worth less than what you paid for it. I live in Phoenix now. It was an enormous problem in Phoenix. So traditionally in America, 
in economic recessions, people left where they were and they moved to where jobs were. Who are the grapes of, who suffered through reading the grapes of wrath? Sorry, not a Steinbeck, not a Steinbeck fan. <laughs> like you had to move to get a job. Well, you can't move if you if your house is underwater, right? So this was a very different kind of recession. So the federal government had to respond in a different way. We had to actually help people where they lived already. And that kicked off this big set of initiatives called the place-based initiatives. So the, uh, that was about how do we take places where people live already and make them better and help with economic development. So with the story of us, we thought at the endowment, uh, we had our chairman at the time was a man named Rocco Landis, he's the theater producer. And he, thought, he was really interested in how can we lean into this and do this work. And so he looked at this study that was done by the Knight Foundation called Soul of the Community. Has anybody read this? It was done in 2012. All right, we got somebody. So um, they interviewed 40,000 people. They worked with Gallup across the country. And they said, why do you love living somewhere? So what do you think the top three responses were from people about why they love living somewhere? Just call some out. Schools, not one of the top three. What else? Okay, yeah, this is an arts meet. This is a setup, yes. So, <laughs> what else? Somebody said community. Family and friends, good. That is one of the top three. What? Safety, not one of the top three. Education, environment. Okay, so I've done this speech a gajillion times in almost all 50 states. And this is typically what I hear, right? Jobs, safety, environment, transit. This is like what most people in government or economic development care about, or these kinds of things. None of these were in the top three, by the way. It's not why people love living somewhere. The number one reason, somebody did say it was social offerings, things to do. It's the number one reason people love living somewhere. Number two, openness. Who wants to live around a bunch of jerks that don't accept you for who you are? Can I see a show of hands? Um, <laughs> Think about how important that is in some of the work that you're doing. It's the number two reason why people love living somewhere. And number three was aesthetics. Beauty. Beauty matters. Can I get a round of applause for beauty? It matters, right? It's actually one of the top reasons why people love living somewhere. So we thought, okay, we sit in a lot of meetings where everybody's talking about this stuff and the arts are kind of over here, right? So that's not good if the, all three of those top three things the arts can help with, right? So we thought, how do we get the arts kind of in line, right? How do we make them just as important as these other things that people care about? Now that is not this. This is wrong. This does not work. That is this, right? Not this. Do you understand the difference? So. There is no, I live in the West now, so I can use gun metaphors. I, uh, <laughs> there is no silver bullet for economic development and community development and equitable, and equitable community development. You need silver buckshot. That is, this is the silver buckshot kind of version of this. Okay, so since we were the federal government, we had to make up some, a new term just to, you know, because we love doing that. So we said, okay, if we combine the arts plus, plus place, Let's call it creative placemaking. Now we can sit around and argue about whether or not this term is the right term. There's the placekeeping version of it. It does sound like, well, did, was there a place there before? You're like making a place? So um, it was a framework by which we were able to frame a lot of work under. So this is the time to take out your phone and take a picture of this slide. Um, we started, once we got into this work, to kind of figure out what can creative placemaking do? So, the arts have a role, it's not every role, but what can it actually do? So, strength and economic development, I think everybody gets this part. The Cabot Theater was reactivated downtown, there's all these new businesses downtown, everybody kind of understands that one. That's the best understood part of creative placemaking. I mean, Peabody Essex just opened a monstrous, you know, new, wonderful uh, uh, expansion, and, you know, it's going to lead to a lot of great things in Salem. So. Uh, but it also seeds civic engagement. Who thinks our civic engagement is going great in America right now? <laughs> creates stewards of a place, creates a sense of belonging, that shared sense of place, that openness. The arts have a huge role to play in that. There's all kinds of proof about that. This one is surprising. It builds resiliency. So there are lots of studies that have been shown because you do this, when there is a natural disaster, and there's just a few of those happening nowadays, 
it's more resilient. Because people are connected, it recovers, you can recover faster from disasters. It has a role. And then obviously the arts contribute to the quality of life. If you don't want to live your life without the arts, you're a crazy person. I can't live without Beyonce, obviously. So, okay. So how does it do it, right? I think people think, oh, it's this artist thing. I, it's this mystery. I don't understand how it works. You know, it's not rocket science. So I think there's kind of these four general categories we like to talk about when you're doing this work. So and they're not perfect, but they're a way to kind of frame what the work is. So first of all, anchoring. Like I said before, the Peabody Essex, the facility we're in now, it's anchoring a place, right? Like it is, an, it is a place you go to do this kind of thing. And the building is just important on the inside as its relationship to the outside. Activating, those things to do. Remember what the number one thing is that communities liked, like? Obviously the arts, had, you saw that great, when that video was really cool by the way. Um, fixing, don't love this term because it sounds like a place is broken, but uh, you know, it makes things beautiful. Remember number three, aesthetics? The arts can make things beautiful. And planning, this one's interesting, I'll show you an example of this. You know, you're about to go through a lot of community planning processes. Okay, who likes Parks and Rec? Did anybody watch Parks and Rec? Like, Okay, uh, community meetings on Parks and Rec, like, you know how hilarious they were? They're actually worse in real life to go to community meetings. So, you know, there's a lot of examples of people using artists to make that better. So, okay. Oh, wait, can I just stop for a second? Can we get an even bigger round of applause for the Bar Foundation and Sansan for that incredible donation they've made to you? And thank you for inviting me. I mean, this doesn't happen, people. I worked in this state for 10 years, and this kind of stuff did not happen. So thank you, and thank you to my host for having me here. Okay, so how did we approach this? We, uh, I'm gonna move a little faster. We uh, started with the NEA's money. Now, if, the, if you're thinking about the federal budget, let's say the federal budget is the size of this facility. This speck of dust on my finger is the size of the NEA budget, right? Pretty small. And so we needed partnerships. So we ended up working with a lot of other federal agencies. We used to say we wanted to be like the cuckoo bird and kind of get uh, our work in where the big money was, like plant our seeds, our eggs in the nest of other birds. So we worked with all kinds of federal agencies and they ended up funding quite a bit of different uh, arts work and I can describe that in more detail later. And we also kind of had this guess that maybe we could get some foundations to care about this work. And it ended up leading to a 10 year initiative called Art Place America. Who's, anybody know Art Place? Anybody gotten an Art Place grant? <laughs> uh, and so it's all of these, I think it's 16 national foundations that came together, 10-year initiative to support this work. I ended up at the NEA creating this program called Our Town. What do you think it's named after? The famous play, uh, you know, spoiler alert, everyone's dead. Um, uh, and what we decided to do was to try something different. Now this is 10 years ago, remember, this work has come a long ways. And we thought, what would it mean for us to require arts organizations to work with their local government to do something to make their community better? And we, it was a guess. And so we kind of threw the uh, guidelines out. It actually was not just a guess, it was actually based on the Massachusetts Cultural Council's Adams Arts Grants, Mary Jenkins, who created that. Love Mary. Well, yeah, let's give Mary a round of applause, she's amazing. Okay, so we threw this out and we had all these museum directors and theater directors calling us and going, why do I have to work with my government? And we had all these mayors calling us and going, why do I have to work with arts people? And we were like, go figure it out. So, it ended up being successful. It's fun. I only have this, I don't have the most updated thing. We sort of infected America with a bazillion different grants. You can see Massachusetts has done very well. But I wanted to say like the scope of what's happening in all different sizes of communities. This is an Eskimo village on the Bering Strait, the native village of Mary's Igloo. Uh, up there in Colorado, that's the town of Last Chance, Colorado, out on the plains, has 12 people in it. Key West, the Acadia portion of Maine. I mean, everywhere, all sizes of communities were doing this. So let me show you some examples real quick of what got funded. So like I said, artists can be part of planning processes. This is a public meeting in Maryland about the future of a transit corridor where people are acting out what they would like to see happen in the transit corridor through dance. Let's look at some anchor projects. This is Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. What is Bethlehem, Pennsylvania famous for? Steel, right? It's where the steel for the Empire State Building and the Statue of Liberty was made. This is the old former steel stacks. This is a, a town of about 80,000 people that now has a music festival that attracts two million people to it. They built a Levitt Pavilion. They partnered with Levitt Pavilion. Small organization called ArtsQuest got a big donation because 
this is an enormous site. On the other part of this site is a casino. Um, and hey, whatever works. Um, and uh, they got, they started, they built this outdoor pavilion. They also built this uh, independent movie theater jazz center that sort of faces this outdoor pavilion. They moved their PBS center to this site. They're kind of combining all these different elements of arts. And the NEA funded this very large piece of public art that's about three stories high and has uh, by Elena, this is by Elena Colombo, and has the names of all the buildings that were built with the steel from the factory there. Uh, who here works in public art? Anybody? Okay. How hard do you think it is to get a piece of public art approved that lights on fire? <laughs> They're pretty ambitious. So this has won all kinds of awards. It's a wonderful thing that's happened there. Let's look at artists and entrepreneurship. This is another big thing that's been happening. You know, a lot of people get artists to go into storefronts. This has been happening for a long time in New England, but I wanted to show you some other examples that I think are interesting. So, how long do you think it takes to get a business license on the Navajo tribe, which is a third of the land within the boundaries of, it's a nation that lives within the boundaries of Arizona. How long to get a business license in the Navajo tribe? Hmm? A lifetime. Wow, you guys, most people are like a month, so you guys are, let's get, let, you don't have to be that critical of them, people, geez. Uh, okay, uh, it takes seven years right now. So this group of designers decided to use design thinking to try to kind of change that process. They launched this website, they're actually launching entrepreneurship centers on the tribe. I, you know, it's very difficult to make economic development happen uh, in a way that supports your tribe if you can't even get a business license. Let's go back to Pennsylvania. This is Chester, Pennsylvania, in a group called Public Workshop. Uh, this is kind of one of those artists and storefronts things. What I like about this one is that they worked with, talking about a sense of belonging and openness, they worked with a series of Somalian uh, refugee Muslim women. How welcome do you think they feel in Chester, Pennsylvania? And uh, helped them design this beautiful storefront where they're gonna sell some of their artwork and uh, food. Let's peek at some activating grants. So uh, this is uh, in rural Wisconsin. This is a group called Worm Farm. They're a group of farmers uh, and artists who work together to try to get people to come out and buy food from these small farms in rural Wisconsin. Um, they're really cool. They decided to do all these large pieces of public art out on the farm so people would want to come out to them. This is about two stories high. It's a huge frame. Uh, they put these big shoes out there. This is a group of Mennonites. This is not a theater production. This is a group of Mennonites and they're traditional. <laughs> hey, I love these outfits. They're so cool. Um, that hat is great. Uh, and they did performances out on the farms and they had just a great sense of humor. Love them. <laughs> okay, this is one of my favorite stories. Uh, this is in Wilson, North Carolina. So well, this is an old former tobacco town. This is quite a famous artist. He passed away a few years ago named uh, Wallace Simpson. He has won all kinds of national awards, and he was a machinist who built these crazy huge whirly gigs in his front yard. And so that's, that's about 300 feet tall, this one here. It's, it's stretched, it's a little strange. So the city of Wilson is former tobacco town. They had all these empty warehouses in downtown. So they decided to try to get, restore his pieces and bring them into this park downtown. I don't have an updated photo. Um, all of these old former tobacco warehouses are all now bought up and are being restored, but that's not the coolest part of this story. So there were quite a few unemployed machinists in this town, and they actually started to employ them in the process of restoring these, these pieces of folk art. And then the Smithsonian heard about this and got interested in it, and now the Smithsonian is buying one of these uh, warehouses and is opening a folk art restoration center there, which is really cool. So. You know, it's not, it, you gotta think about the multiple layers that this stuff can do to connect across your community, right? It's not just about the art performance or the art process, it can be about how do you connect, to, like Sansan said, you have to connect out of the arts world to do this work. Okay, this is in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Has anybody been to Art Prize? Okay, this is a kind of a American Idol of, for artists. They. Uh, apply you, you to enter the contest and they show about 2,000 works across this city over a period of about, two, I think it's three weeks now. This is a town of about 180,000. They get about 400,000 visitors that come for this. And then you vote for your favorite art piece and you win $250,000 if it gets the best one. So this was my favorite, it did not win. But this is 10,000 people waiting for 100,000 paper planes to be thrown off the top of some buildings, which is, 
This is not a hard thing to do. This is just manual labor and paper, people. So, um, okay, I'm going to show you one last picture that I need to rush through to get to a little, a, a little bit more information for you. So I'm going to show you a short video. This is a great project, a partnership between uh, the Miami Airport, the Miami Poetry Festival, and some owners of parking garages, and a bunch of elementary school kids. Love this project. <laughs> My poem is called, I am from a great place. I am from a place where some days it can be cold. It can be cold that you feel like you are in the North Pole. I am from a place where it can be hot. It is so hot you feel like you are on fire. I am from a place where it does not snow. My name is Tywan Williams and the grade I am is fourth grade. My name is Naima Marshall. In the school I go to is Archer Villa. I'm in third grade. I consider myself as a poet. I wrote a poem. They painted it on a rooftop. And now people, when people fly in the air, they can see my poem. emotions of how we feel and ten people chose people chose it to paint on in parking lots and rooftops so people in airplanes can see them. When I look at a cloud I feel like I am one. Belonging, right? Aesthetics, openness. Okay, let me get to the, uh, quickly get to the second and third parts of my story. So a lot of work got funded. There's a gajillion grants out there. There's a million examples to look at. But how do you do it, right? And how do you do it in a way where you don't have to just start from the beginning because there's been so much knowledge collected? So there was this kind of second phase of knowledge collection and dispersion to the field. Dispersion, that's not the right word. Um, kind of spreading it around to the field that happened about, started happening about five years ago and it came out of the Kresge Foundation first. And the kind of, what we realized is that there's a lot of different languages in, when you're doing place-based work. So like if you ever spent the night with a bunch of transit engineers, you might want to commit suicide. Sorry, my friend, transit engineer friends. Um, but the, it's, there's a whole language they speak, right? It's very difficult to understand some of the acronyms. And so the idea was from the funders was really do we start funding the organizations that those people care about and that those people go to to start caring about this work? This is the first example of it. The, this was out of an organization called Transportation for America. They created a whole website about how to, how to do transit and creative placemaking. Um, care about equitable development, which all of us should. There's a really important national organization called Policy Link that got funded, you know, produced this paper. Uh, the Center for Community Practice produced stuff. There's, I'm just going to run through a bunch of examples. Care about parks and creative placemaking. Trust for Public Land has a guidebook now. Uh, community Development Finance Institutions got a bunch of money to try to do some of this work. Uh, we'll skip this one. Uh, Art Place America started funding a bunch of this work. They have a big summit every year that a bunch of people go to and can exchange ideas. They got the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco to publish this whole book on creative placemaking and community development. They started publishing all these guidebooks for different, creative place, for different community development fields. This is the one for public safety. There's one for housing. There's one for environment. There's another one for transit. That you can all go to their website and see. They started funding community development corporations to see what we could learn from working with community development corporations. And then NEA created this kind of this website called Exploring Our Town, where you can literally look at, look at examples of things. Uh, we created this kind of knowledge building grant program uh, where organizations like Board for the Arts and the International Downtown Associated created a guide for business districts. Uh, rural creative placemaking, there's a bunch of stuff you can go find now. Um, public art, there's a ton of stuff from Forecast Public Art happening. Uh, if you care about music and public spaces, uh, Project for Public Spaces did a project with Chamber Music America. Uh, I helped edit this book, this is a plug, that you can download for free called How to Do Creative Placemaking, which has a bunch of great information in for it. I'm, sure, I mean, we can I'm assuming we can share these slides so you guys can find this stuff. But long story short, there's a lot of stuff out there, right? 
We are light. If the number of books you could read about this stuff was on a bookshelf like this, it's like filling a library now. There, you don't have to start from zero. There is a ton of information out there. So the third part of this story that I want to say is, you know, it really is about, and my clicker died. Um, it really is about how do we scale the work now, which is why it's so important what you guys are all doing here. How do we continue to help people understand how to get arts in line with that other stuff? This is the kind of meeting that needs to happen more. We need to have more regional work happening. We need to be figuring out how to measure this work more. We need to have real measurements. I will, right now, if you're in the community development field, everything that we measure that is supposed to be successes do not actually measure the things that anybody really truly should care about, right? Like we measure number of units. We measure transit lines done. Well, that doesn't get to the social offerings or the openness or the other things that actually truly are about why someone loves living somewhere. So we actually need to hack measurement systems. And I could do another three hours on that, but you ready? Okay. Um, and I think regional work is so important. I am so excited to be in a, meet, a room in Massachusetts where people are talking about working regionally. I know what happens in the States. So it is really, really, really exciting. And I want to say revolutionary and give yourselves a round of applause for doing that. So. So I just want to leave you with this note. Beauty matters. Equity matters. And justice matters more than ever now. And I will say right now that beauty is a justice issue. If you do not believe me, you can go and read Elaine Scarry's book on beauty and being just. Everyone deserves beauty. And everyone deserves to feel like they belong and have a sense of justice in their life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, now I'd like to um, bring up to the podium Cara Elliott Ortega, who is the Chief of Arts and Culture, the Director of Arts and Culture for the City of Boston. She will speak right into the mic if you can. Hi, everyone. Oh, there we go. No. Ah, there it is. Okay, we're good. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having me here today. I'm really excited to um, talk to you about what we've been up to in Boston with Boston Creates, our 10-year cultural plan for the city. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got to a cultural plan, what that entailed, but I'm going to spend most of the time just throwing lots of examples at you of what we've been up to for the last three years. So um, I apologize if I'm speeding through a lot of things. Uh, but... Our story starts with our mayor, Mayor Marty Walsh. Um, he ran in 2014 on a platform, oh yeah, some love for Mayor Marty Walsh, that's good. Um, he ran on a platform of reinvesting in the arts. Um, it was part of what he talked about when he was running for mayor. There was a mayor's office um, of cultural affairs in the 80s in Boston that got subsumed into a tourism office and kind of dissolved. And so there really hadn't been a focus on investing in the arts from municipal government in Boston for some time. Um, so one of the first things he did when he became mayor was to create the mayor's office of arts and culture, um, which is now what I direct. Um, here's a nice quote from him. I should mention that my role also didn't exist, chief of arts and culture. Um, it's a cabinet level position, so the director of the mayor's office of arts and culture gets to sit, literally has a seat at the table in the mayor's cabinet um, next to the police chief, the chief of economic development, chief of streets and all of those good city functions. Um, and I think that this really shows that the plan and the investment in the arts is about something broader than just having more arts programs. It's really about a bigger cultural shift, making Boston a place that understands and values robust cultural life and vibrancy. And in practice for me, that also means being intentional and sometimes a little bit aggressive about our role in bringing that value and the creative process itself into the public sector. So fighting a lot of risk aversion, risk averse bureaucracy and the status quo to make room for people, expression and ideas so that Boston can feel like a welcoming place but that it actually becomes a welcoming place. And here's a little bit of the timeline. Um, we started a planning process, an 18 month planning process in 2015. Um, just like any new office, we needed a roadmap for what we were gonna be doing. This was funded, um, halfway funded by the Barr Foundation. Um, so this is thanks to them as well. Uh, and this was an 18 month process with about a year of really intense community participation and engagement. 
Um, and as I said before, this is something that um, the city hadn't done in a long time. There's rumors that there was a cultural plan from the 80s, but I've never seen it, so I don't think it exists. Um, so there was a lot of pent up energy, you know, from arts organizations, from artists, from people who had been trying to really make it in the city of Boston without a lot of resources. And the planning process itself was pretty unprecedented for the city. Um, we had three town halls, we had individual interviews, we had lots of uh, focus groups, hearing from different um, groups of constituents like higher ed, um, creative youth development organizations. But we also did something that was unique um, to train community leaders in their neighborhoods to host community conversations about the importance of arts and culture and what they wanted to see in their neighborhoods. So through that process, we had 118 community conversations, um, which was incredibly valuable information. We also had an online asset map and a survey about how do you create in your daily life I mean, what are the barriers to that creation that had over 3,200 responses? And that per, part of the point of that survey was also to break open this idea that, you know, creation is some kind of fine arts studio activity and that, you know, if you're cooking dinner with your family, if you're gardening in your backyard, that there are a lot of other kinds of creativity that people do in their daily lives. So we compiled all of that information after 18 months. Uh, and we have a series of goals, five goals within that strategies and tactics about what the arts sector needs in the city of Boston in order to thrive. And one thing that's unique about this compared to some other cultural plans that are happening around the country is that this didn't just say what should the mayor's office of arts and culture be responsible for, but really what did the whole ecosystem need? And we even tagged every single item in this plan, city owned, city led, or city catalyzed, which is to say that there are some things that we might not do. We might convene a room full of people who need to self-organize and bring something else to the table in the city. Um, and you can read the whole thing at plan.bostoncreates.org. Um, but the five goals, which now we live by and have been our roadmap for the last three years, are to create fertile ground for a vibrant and sustainable arts and culture ecosystem, keep artists in Boston and attract new ones here, recognizing and supporting their essential contribution to city life, Cultivate a city where all cultural traditions and expressions are respected, promoted, and equitably resourced. Integrate arts and culture into all aspects of civic life, inspiring all Bostonians to value practice and reap the benefits of creativity. And mobilize likely and unlikely partners to generate excitement, demand, and resources for Boston's arts and culture sector. So some very good lofty goals. Um, so how did we actually do this and what did we start doing first? So one of the first things we did was to think about uh, support for individual artists. We heard a lot from individuals throughout the planning process that they felt unrecognized, there weren't funds for them, they didn't know where to go for support, um, and there had been people who had been trying really hard to make creative work in the city of Boston for a long time and are now priced out, or just felt like there wasn't anywhere for them to go. Um, so one of the first things we did was create new uh, grants specifically for individual artists. Um, the most successful of which I think has been something we call the Opportunity Fund, which is a small grant, a thousand or two thousand dollars, to help artists with professional development. But the point of that grant is to really ask artists, what do you need? And have them respond to us and say, you know, I need a camera for a show. I need to make prints in order to participate in this exhibition. I need to attend a conference so I can actually learn and expand my artistry. Um, and we've made over 300 of those grants since we started that program. Uh, we also have an artist resource desk and an artist resource manager who is a person who manages that program and some of the other things that you see on this slide. Uh, and she sees and helps over a thousand artists a year, either through direct office hours or online um, answering questions, helping point people towards resources. And this is really like a one-stop shop in City Hall for any creative person who maybe is trying to do something where they actually need city approval, like permits, they're trying to take advantage of a grant that we have, but also just somebody who's looking for a place to land in the city of Boston and is looking to connect to a network and to other opportunities. Uh, we also have been learning from that process about what, what artists really need in order to thrive in Boston. And so we have um, created a few different ways to increase professional development and technical, technical assistance for individuals. And we're really excited to be working this year with the Economic Development Office in the city uh, to bring on technical assistance providers who actually have experience working with the arts specifically. Um, so we have a series of um, creative business help workshops, workshops for sole proprietors, um, and this is actually leveraging federal housing and community development funds to help artists and to help small creative businesses. We've also been convening and doing research around teaching artists because so many artists as a gig, as a way to make money, also are arts educators and teach. 
Uh, and so we've been thinking about what does it look like to create a greater Boston network of teaching artists? What's our role in doing that? And what kind of professional development do they need? And doing things like this uh, creative aging pilot where we're training both our library branches as well as our artists in what creative aging is and how they can work together to bring those services to branch libraries. A second area of work that's um, critical for us because cost of living is so high is space and facilities. I'm also a city planner by training and our office is one of the few arts offices in the country that also has a, a cultural planner role on staff. So we have city planning embedded within our office. Um, and when we started this work, it really felt like there was a space crisis. And even though we're making some great progress, it still feels like there's a space crisis. Every um, artist building has a huge waiting list. Organizations of all sizes find challenges. Um, so this continues to be an area of work for us that was also called out in the plan. One of the first things we did in 2017 was commission a study specifically on performing arts facilities that looked at the supply and demand of performing arts spaces. If you took this theater and just plopped it in Boston somewhere, it would be used you know, from the moment it could be open until late at night, all the time. There's so much demand for this size space. And that's what we found through this facility assessment um, that appropriateness, people are squeezing whatever their artistic practices into whatever they can afford, and so it's determining a lot of the kind of work that can be done. And there's this endless demand for small size venues and rehearsal spaces that are affordable. Um, and people's standards are incredibly low. And we asked people, what do you really need for the space to work for you? They said, electricity would be nice, maybe bathrooms. <laughs> so it's helpful to have this research done because it shows these gaps in the market. And we've been able to leverage this to negotiate for new spaces that are a part of um, private development projects. So now in the seaport, there are three new theaters that are exactly the size that we found we needed through this assessment. We've also seen a lot of organizations using this as a part of their market research as they're thinking about expanding facilities or creating new facilities for the first time. So we have recording studios, dance studios, um, affordably priced theater rehearsal space that's all kind of uh, looked to this study for information on, on what the market is. We've also spent a lot of time thinking about uh, space for individual artists. Um, this is something that I worked on before I became Chief of Arts and Culture, uh, and I'll just run through some examples of what we've been doing. Um, one of the first things is collecting data. Uh, we took over a process of certifying artists for affordable live workspace a few years ago, and when we did that, we put the whole process online, and now every time you get certified as an artist for affordable housing, you get a survey from us that asks about your household size, your income, what your discipline is, what specific space needs you have, and things like this. What's most important to you? Affordability. It's not surprising, but it's still helpful to ask. Um, and we've been putting that data to work um, specifically in a city-led project where we worked with our housing office that had some parcels that could be redeveloped, um, city-owned parcels, and we worked with the community to get them okay with the idea of this being an entire building full of artists' live workspace. And so we took the data that we had been uh, surveying from artists and we did a focus group and we actually created an addendum to a city RFP, which for fellow bureaucrats in the room, they'll understand how challenging that is to do, um, that was specifically about what artists need in space and what that space should look like. And this was the selected project that's going forward that's also exploring a new approach for us of having affordable artist live space, 30-ish units on top of a shared co-working um, artist studio space on the ground floor. So this is happening. Now we're learning about how hard it is to finance. Um, we also have uh, launched a process of creating artist live work guidelines. So this is the first time that the city of Boston is going to have real design guidelines about what artist space should look like and what the special considerations are. And it gets into uh, a level of architectural detail that's incredibly helpful and will be adopted by policy in our housing department as well as in our planning and development review process. But more importantly, it also just takes down uh, another barrier to developers, private developers, or CDCs being interested in this work, which is to say, this is what it looks like. This is totally doable. And now we can use this document to do some case making. We just had a focus group with 20 developers on this uh, not so long ago, a couple weeks ago, and they were incredibly enthusiastic. They responded really well to the guidelines. And they were like, yeah, we get it. We want to do this. We see the need. We like the guidelines. Now let's figure out how we get some of these projects done. Um, we've heard about equity a little bit today. Um, equity came up over and over again in the planning process, disparities in funding, resources, and awareness. Um, and it became lifted into its own goal of the plan. It's the third goal in Boston Creates. 
And I have to say right now, there are very few conversations that I have on a day-to-day -day basis that are not in some way about questions of representation, diversity, or equity, particularly because of the speed of development in Boston and how fast things are changing and the physical landscape is changing um, as people struggle to maintain their communities and their cultures. So this is something that uh, shows up in every single one of our programs. And I'll just talk about two things right now on this um, list. One is our Boston Cultural Council, which is our local um, entity for making grants to organizations. We get some funding from the state, from the Mass Cultural Council, and then we um, more than match that with city funds. Um, so it's around $500,000 a year right now. Uh, last year, the Boston Cultural Council drafted a working equity statement about what they thought equity meant in Boston uh, and started putting that to work um, awarding additional funds to organizations that they deemed model equity organizations that really lived out the, the equity statement. Um, and in order to do that, we had to change our application, um, a process that we're continuing this year, but we were really asking organizations, who do you serve? Um, how do you articulate um, diversity, equity, inclusion in your organization leadership, staff, and programming? And so they're starting that process of thinking about how to reallocate funds based on an equity lens. Um, I also want to call out our Boston Artists in Residence program, um, which I'll talk about more later, but we have within the city of Boston an Office of Resilience and Racial Equity, uh, and that they produced their own plan two years ago. And so last year we had our entire Artists in Residence program really focusing on the connection between other city departments and that racial equity plan. Um, we've also been piloting some new programs. Uh, so this past year, we started a new project partnership grant, which has a priority on reoccurring events and festivals that create opportunities for artists of color, artists with disabilities, and LGBTQ non-binary artists. Um, and this isn't just about having project grants, it really is about the partnership. So we're taking this year to really follow those events through the process, whatever their process is, and understand what their needs are, and learning things about gaps in uh, familiarity with large-scale production and marketing, thinking about how can we build out a capacity-building program that supports these things that are often kind of recurring festivals and cultural traditions in neighborhoods. We're also in a new partnership with MassArt, exploring how artists of color um, can be supported to engage in their racial justice work and social justice work um, in the city of Boston. Um, and lastly on here, increasing cultural competency within the arts and culture sector. This is something that we're starting right now with ourselves. Uh, we will be launching some equity work this fall that is actually going to take what was one goal of Boston Creates and make it the lens for all of the work that we do. So we're actually looking to relaunch the mission and framework of our office through an equity lens um, and create a framework for accountability internally as, as an organization um, within city government. This is really exciting for us. Um, I think this is something that a lot of people in Boston who we work with have been looking for and have been looking for language around, and so we're excited to model part of this process um, and think about what it means for city government to really take uh, equity seriously within the organization and then also work with all of the arts organizations in Boston who are thinking about this and these issues right now. And we don't know what this is gonna look like exactly, but we have a sense of some of what this is going to touch. Like I mentioned before, reallocating where our resources go, thinking about uh, the role of arts and culture in planning and development and in city building and making sure that people are really represented in city building. Thinking about city identity, Boston is a majority minority city, um, but our narrative is Paul Revere and sports. Um, and that's something that's really acutely felt by people. People feel alienated by it. And even thinking about tourism and what is the image of Boston that we're selling to the world and thinking about how can we diversify that narrative even as a starting point is really interesting to us. And then lastly, cultural competency, um, particularly thinking about the role of artists and of culture in helping us um, move through this work. So we work with a lot of artists who are amazing facilitators and trainers, and how can we bring that into the picture? Um, to that last point, a lot of what we do is advocate for the arts in other areas of city government. Um, and a lot of this is how does, how does arts and culture and creativity actually show up in daily life for people, in civic life, within city hall and municipal government, but also something that's visible to somebody who's just walking through their neighborhood. And a large part of that for us is public art. So the biggest financial investment from the city coming out of the cultural planning process is our percent for art program. This year in our capital budget, which is a five-year budget, we have $13 million allocated to commissioning new permanent public artworks. Um, this is money that the city has never put towards public art before, so it's um, incredibly exciting for us. And we have projects started around the city uh, integrating these 
public artworks into libraries, into new school buildings, into road reconstruction projects. And in addition to that, we've started a new annual fund specifically for commissioning temporary art of the Transformative Public Art Project. And I think what's exciting to me about this is that, yes, there's a huge financial commitment from the city, which is amazing, um, but we're also seeing other departments work public art into their federal grants or work public art into their public works design projects. And that's really where I feel like the transformation um, will be more impactful so that we're seeing other areas of city building and of public life coming to us and saying, how do we work this in and what other dollars can we leverage that aren't just arts dollars to make this a better place? Um, some examples of what we've been working on, everything from kind of traditional bronzes that tell the story of immigration in the, in the North End to more contemporary kind of uh, placemaking projects. These are uh, modeled after picnic chairs, but they're going to be made out of bronze kind of floating on the grass here. Um, funding some really exciting temporary work. We were one of many funders on this project uh, that brought Nick Cave's work Augment to the city of Boston. This was done, um, commissioned through Now and There, which is an amazing uh, public art organization in Boston, and it's a series of kind of lawn inflatables stitched together into this big um, kind of intimidating mass that we then paraded from one neighborhood to another, um, which was also in and of itself an amazing experience. And now this building that you see here uh, has pieces of the, the inflatable public art popping out of the windows. And another mural in Chinatown that was installed this summer. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about our Boston Artists in Residence program, but this is one of the ways that we really make sure creativity shows up in municipal government. Um, this program uh, embeds social and civic practice artists into city departments to co-design projects and imagine and test ways to make the city's policies, processes, and practices more equitable and human-centered. There are year-long residencies where artists get a stipend and funding for materials um, and attend workshops and professional development sessions throughout the year. And I'll give one example of what this looks like. Um, this is Karen Young on the bottom left, um, one of our artists in residence from the last year. Uh, she is a community organizer and a community builder who also works in um, taiko drumming. And she really wanted to work with older adults, um, particularly these women of color um, in Grove Hall, who she felt like their voices were really marginalized in city process. And so she brought her pra practice of drumming to this community center and worked with this group of women, um, kind of like through a, almost like a teaching artistry um, program to start. And there was a cultural exchange component where they performed at the Cherry Blossom Festival in downtown Boston. But what wound up happening was that these women felt incredibly empowered by this kind of physical drumming that they were doing together and what they were learning and how they were expressing themselves. And they really had a new sense of community and kind of ability and agency and they wanted to do something with it. And the artists wanted to do something more. Um, and so they became transportation advocates, obviously. Um, so this group, this group of women um, who now go by Older and Boulder, and they have some amazing branding, and they wear these amazing t-shirts, um, they decided that they wanted to tackle an issue in their community. And so they looked at this crosswalk right outside of the community center that was really unsafe. It's kind of a cut through street, and cars were just speeding down it. And they wanted to call attention to that. And so they kind of organized a protest sort of in collaboration with city government, if that's possible. Um, they did their drumming, they had signs, they raised awareness. The artists helped produce videos around this and helped kind of support the connection to city departments like Transportation and our Elderly Commission, which is called Age Strong. Um, and they have been successful. So there is now going to be a signaled crosswalk right here. It's in the capital budget. It's going to happen. Um, and I think this is a really great example because it shows that the process is really the product of this residency. There's no kind of artistic predetermined outcome. This is genuinely about how a creative person um, meshes with city process and city problems and also community members um, to create a different kind of experience and a different kind of engagement. So if we were to take a policy lesson from this, it might be about what does equitable process really look like in transportation planning? Um, lastly, I wanna talk about funding. Um, I mentioned that the Boston Cultural Council was looking into equity and thinking about how to change their funding uh, to organizations. And this fall, they have announced a new strategy focused on general operating grants for small organizations. 
Um, this is specifically looking at which parts of the sector in Boston were not funded. Um, we have over 500 arts nonprofits registered with the IRS in Boston. I think it's more per capita than almost any other major city. And the majority of those organizations have annual budgets under $75,000 a year, but we don't really know who they are and we don't really know what they need or what their staffing is like. Um, and so we've decided to focus that funding specifically on organizations with budgets under two million with the majority of the funding going to organizations with budgets under one million. Um, and this is gonna be the start of a two to five year experiment to see who these organizations are, learn more about them and start to think about building out a, a capacity building program that really focuses on this lower end of the, of the ecosystem in arts organizations. Um, and we know from previous studies that have been done in Boston that these organizations may be one of the only orgs that are really serving their community, that are providing accessible arts programs. They're more likely to be focused on cultural diversity and social justice. Um, so we're really interested in seeing where that work goes and we're just starting that right now this fall. So I wanna um, wrap up just talking about placemaking and place-based ba place work. Uh, I think that a lot of where um, we see all of this work coming together is really on the ground in kind of a placemaking context. Um, and I should mention uh, that we are actually working in two kind of cultural districts, one that's more of a city district called an arts and innovation district and one that's a state designated district, Latin Quarter, which you see here. Um, and we're working actually with two partners in those districts that have received art place funding before, that have kind of a history of doing um, this, this kind of work. And so uh, just to give an example of how all of this works together, um, this is the Latin Quarter. It's a dynamic cultural district of um, Latino immigrants, mostly. Um, it's, that immigrant population has been there for decades. 65% of the area's 125 businesses are immigrant owned. Um, and it became a state designated district two years ago through um, the Mass Cultural Council. And it focuses uh, specifically on Afro-Latin arts and artists. Um, we received an NEA Our Town grant in partnership with High Square Task Force there, um, who's the managing entity of the cultural district to do cultural planning in this area, um, working with MAPC. Um, and the reason for focusing in here and for working on a cultural plan is really to build political power for this community. So this is an area that's experiencing intense um, housing pressure, gentrification. Um, the immigrant population is starting to decline. Um, and so we really wanted to think about culture broadly defined and the vulnerability of this community and what can cultural strategies do to strengthen the community that's actually there. Um, so the cultural plan is going to really ask anyone who's coming into this space, whether they're an elected official or a developer or a new resident, to engage with the community in the way that it wants to be engaged. It's a document that talks about the identity of this place, the history of the place, and says, if you want to come here, here are your standards for participating. And we expect that to be respected. And our office, as a municipal office, can leverage that document and make sure that we're reinforcing that through city government. Um, we also helped um, a lot with storytelling through this grant, uh, funding a documentary about the district um, that's being shown now, um, and really kind of getting the word out there that this, this place has a known identity. Another district that we're working in also explicitly um, from an anti-displacement perspective is in Upham's Corner in Boston. This is an area where, again, through Art Place and other funding, there's been a long history of community-driven kind of creative placemaking projects. We have a 1,400-seat theater that we own and manage in this district, as well as the promise of a new branch library, so there are also some physical assets. Um, but it's also, again, a place that's kind of on the brink of experiencing a lot of displacement. So this is actually really a partnership between the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture and the Office of Economic Development, um, as well as work with the Planning Office and the Housing Offices to think about what can we do here to stem gentrification and to think about community ownership of place. And what the city did was they came in and actually purchased parcels and helped the Land Trust, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, purchase parcels to take them off the market. And we're now um, at the tail end of a two-year community process to decide what kind of development should happen in those places with a, a strong emphasis on affordable housing, on artist live work housing, on affordable commercial space, um, and on kind of revitalizing this 1400 seat theater and thinking about new partnership models to make it accessible to the community as well as to local artists. 
Um, and creativity was a part of the planning process as well. Uh, this is a picture of one of our community meetings um, that's actually on the stage of the Strand Theater. And we uh, worked with a playback theater group that walked around and listened to what the community conversations were and what the issues were that were being discussed at each of these breakout tables. And at the end of the meeting, the playback theater group performed a dramatized version of that back out to the audience um, who had just been participating in it. Um, and we do surveys after each one of these. And people said it was the best community meeting they'd ever been to. Um, and it's exciting for me. I'm a city planner by training. And so I see kind of the traditional planning format that cities go through. And I think this has been a really amazing experience to think about how can we be more interdepartmental, more cross-disciplinary, and have arts be a part of a planning process that makes the whole um, experience and the outcome more holistic and more representative of the people who are participating in it. So how does this all map back out onto our five goals? This is our progress um, as of year three. Um, and you know we've done really well in some areas. We've focused on artists, so that's 64% complete, um, which is great to be able to say. Um, but there are still areas where, where we have to grow, and we're looking at uh, year five, which is the halfway point of our 10-year plan, and thinking about what do we need to prioritize between now and then. And that's really where the focus on equity um, and on bringing in that work into the office and shifting the frame of the entire work of the office came from is saying, well, we really need to be able to do that work and speak to that work so that when we get to the halfway point and we're thinking about what's coming down in the second half of this planning process, that we have that figured out and that we can speak to it and be accountable to it. Um, so I hope that some of this resonates with what you're tackling in your communities. Um, and I think just to end with a little bit of encouragement from the city funding side, um, our office uh, is now an office of 14 people. And this past year, for the FY20 budget, we had a 37% increase. So we're now a budget, um, an office with a budget of over $2 million, which is incredibly exciting and needs to go up a lot more, but I like the number 37%. Um, and I think that uh, it's just really exciting to see that a lot of what I've just been talking about is now really a part of our budget and a part of what we do. A lot of those programs were piloted as grant programs, as partnerships, and now the Artists in Residence program is gonna continue you know, as long as we have that, that funding. Um, so I look forward to seeing this work grow. I think that there's a lot of room for the pie to continue to grow as well um, as we continue this work together and excited to see a regional conversation happen. I think we spend a lot of time and have worried about what happens within our city boundaries, but all of the major issues that we're tackling, I mean, especially housing, I didn't really get to talk about climate here, but climate comes up a lot, and what's the role of arts and creativity in that conversation? Um, these are all regional issues, and so I think that it's great to see this group come together, and I'm excited to work with you in the future. Thank you.
so much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Wow. That was wonderful. So we're going to be welcoming to the stage a group um, of people from Peabody, the Peabody Cultural Collaborative and the mayor of Peabody. This is one of our funded projects, Curious City, and they're going to be talking to you uh, about the uh, origins and the, and the success of that project. Um, but our, the point I, I want you to all take away from this is this is what great collaboration looks like. So I'll turn it over to the Peabody Cultural Collaborative. Welcome, and, and the fact that there's not room is, I think, exactly what we're trying to communicate here. This is uh, a, just a tremendous group and a great collaboration. My name is Stratton Lloyd. I'm the COO, and I oversee community leadership at the Essex County Community Foundation. And it's really my joy to sit up here as really just the facilitator of this great conversation um, and to be able to communicate and demonstrate this great project to everyone and how it represents everything we're trying to do. It represents just a tremendous level of teamwork, collaboration, persistence, and collective vision. And, uh, and so it's a joy to have you all up here. And let's get going. Let's, uh, let's share what we've got. So as a start, I think we're just going to go quickly down the line and have everyone just say their name and, uh, and say their association to uh, demonstrate the, uh, the cross-sector element of this effort. I am Susan Dodge, Director of ArcWorks, a program of Northeast Arc. I'm Alyssa Robinson. I'm the Director of the Peabody Institute Library. Camille Bartlett, Executive Director of Peabody TV. Good morning. Uh, Ted Betancourt, Mayor of the City of Peabody. Uh, Kurt Bellavance, Director of Planning and Community Development. Tim Brown, Director of Innovation and Strategy for the Northeast Arc. Martha Holden, former Library Director and Northeast ARC board member. Deanne Healy, Vice President and Market Manager with Salem Five Bank and Volunteer President of Peabody Main Streets. Andrew Levin, City Planner, City of Peabody. Mark Whiting, General Manager of the North Shore Mall. We may have one mic here. <laughs> so you see government, nonprofit, philanthropic, uh, businesses all coming together um, in this collaboration. And, and this group had, had already come together a little bit and had already started working a fair amount um, under the P Peabody Cultural Collaborative. So tell us a little bit why that group was important and why it was important to this effort. So I'd like to give you a little bit of a history of the Peabody Cultural Collaborative. Um, it was a group that was formed in 2010. And it was originally driven by our partner, Northeast Arc, that operates a, the um, ArcWorks Community Arts Center in Peabody. It's an inclusive arts space for people with and without disabilities. Um, we incorporated as a nonprofit in 2012, and I think it's noteworthy to say that um, when we drew up our bylaws, we did include a commitment to inclusion, um, particularly, particularly for um, people with disabilities. We wrote them right into our bylaws. By 2010, our individual organizations had a history of success, particularly in the past five years or so. The City, Northeast Arc, Peabody Institute Library, Peabody Access Telecommunications, Peabody Area Chamber of Commerce, and the Peabody Historical Society were all really thriving individually, but we were working within our own silos. These organizations traditionally considered non-arts organizations were really driving the culture and the arts programming within the city of Peabody. PCC was formed to unite the partner organizations and to realize a vision of Peabody as a destination city with inclusive, diverse, and groundbreaking cultural and arts offerings. This was to be realized in cross-promotional 
and um, placemaking activities. We also hoped, of course, that um, our broad membership would make us more attractive to funders and to um, better fit the criteria for grants funding programs. So PCC's initial goal was to um, apply for funding to, to designate a cultural district within the city. Um, the grant process required that active stakeholders come and work together um, to form the um, concept for that process. This, um, this participation served as the impetus for solidifying our partnership. Although we were ultimately successful in that application, external events and opportunities presented within our, our partner organizations led us in different directions. All of these activities would unite us, create fun and engaging spaces, and spur economic activity in Peabody. Some of the things that we worked on were participation in the transformative, transformative district initiative for creative use of downtown spaces, spaces to spur investment in economic development, a mosaic project at the city's Centennial Bikeway, promotion of the Creativity Lab, a, an innovative uh, maker space at the Peabody Institute Library, a mur mural project on Linfield Street, which allowed us to work closely with our business partners. Support of the Main Street's traffic initiative. This was an in initiative to make downtown Peabody more pedestrian friendly, to go from four to two lanes, to um, install sidewalk curbing, and implementing other pedestrian friendly measures. Management of the public piano project. Promotion of a number of different initiatives by Northeast Arc, um, no notably Breaking Grounds Cafe and the Black Box Theater in Peabody. In more recent years, we've worked closely with Main, Peabody Main Streets to support fun activities downtown, including pop-up pubs, dinner on Main, an annual car show, Halloween event, holiday events, and much more. And finally, our successful application for ECCF and other funding to develop the concept and establish Curious City a regional children's museum for children ages 2 through 10 and their caregivers. So the development of the PCC was really a culmination of 20 years or so of us as uh, individual groups striving to create cultural and arts programming, um, uniting and sharing our ideas with each other, uh, winning over a public that was often skeptical and ultimately realizing that we shared similar goals and we faced similar barriers. We quickly developed a what benefits one benefits all mentality, and it continues to drive us today. Terrific. Yeah, I got another microphone here, so I'll hold this one down here. So in the spirit of, of this project and initiative, Curious City, and the idea of a pop-up children's museum, this could have been done alone. It could have been done by one organization going off and just trying to do it themselves. It could have been done by the city going off and trying to do it themselves. What's the value or what's some of the lessons learned through the collaboration of this cross sector, coming together as multiple different stakeholders to realize the vision of this initiative? What's the value of that? So I'll take that. Thank you. Um, the value is really having that shared vision and using multiple organizations to achieve that goal. Um, each one of us has resources available, um, but if you look at you look at each organization individually, uh, collectively, we can do it better. And so, as Martha alluded to, as we've started projects over the course of the last five years within the city to collaborate, we've learned a lot from that. Our very first pop-up. Um, parklet that we did five years ago was, you know, four organizations. It was the city that could provide funding. It was North Shore Community Development Coalition that could provide uh, the building of the parklet. It was the chamber that could coordinate um, the activity of the event and the library that had the resources to um, activate that space. And so from that one project, we learned that by working together, we were stronger in making something happen. And so when we looked at, um, when we actually, when each organization sit sitting here today heard about the um, Bar Foundation grant, when we first met, we all came to the table, each with our own idea about what we wanted to apply for. 
but through conversation and, as Jason mentioned earlier, learning to speak um, the language of other groups and listening to what they were trying to achieve. We now have developed this dialogue in PBD that we know what we want the end result to be and how do we work with each organization to um, tap into what they're best at to bring it to the table. Um, so in terms of um, Curious City, you know, Main Streets wanted an anchor institution. The city wanted economic revitalization. The library wanted to enrich learning experiences. Northeast Arc wanted an inclusionary um, uh, project. PBD Access TV wanted to showcase the art and creative um, economy and culture. And businesses um, wanted to see the area thrive because the more people we can get downtown into visiting Peabody, you know, that rising tide lifts all boats. Terrific, yeah, team effort there. So I'm gonna jump ahead to the question for Kurt too around this. So one of the things that's interesting is we've, we've worked with these 12 different projects across the county. We've learned a lot about sort of this systems work and this collaborative work and what are sort of the core principles of, of what makes this collective work function. And you talked about that, a shared vision. You know, can everyone rally around a common goal, not just the vision of their organization, but the vision of the initiative? What is the goal? What is the effort? Number two is a clear sense of what the roles are, what the responsibilities are for each of the different organizations involved. And clearly you, you outlined that. You know, people had different roles and responsibilities which all are sort of harnessed towards that, that common goal. A third key thing which is really critical in all of this, you know, for this collective work is around metrics and around how do you measure success? And are you aligned on sort of that, your metrics of success and do you have a mechanism for measuring that as you go to achieve that common goal and to maintain that alignment. So I don't know, Kurt, if you have something to say on that. Yeah. Uh, sure. I know the uh, Jason mentioned earlier about how do you how do you know if you're successful and, and you know people yeah. want to be there. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to look at, at least from um, you know a perspective from the city and, and working under the under the mayor's guidance is, is this something that you know we want to grow, uh, grow, and how are we going to grow that, and how are we going to achieve what we want to achieve and, and we've been successful in doing pop-ups uh, throughout the city for the last several years so that came to our mind is let's do a pop-up children's museum and kind of test the water and, and see if that works and some of the numbers we wanted to we want to track the numbers through through the ticketing system uh, we wanted to track that if, if someone came in and paid cash you know where were they coming from and so forth and some of the numbers that we have and I'll look down on my cheat sheet uh, we had more than 6,700 people uh, visit the museum in, in this 90-day period, and I say 90 days because we weren't open every day. Um, we were open uh, four days a week. Uh, we had 40% um, of the folks there used uh, what was the library pass, so it was, we spread the word through the different libraries in the North Shore that they could use that and come and visit us, uh, so that was a, a good group of people. Um, we had 122 different communities come. To the, to the Children's Museum. We had 22 different states so, that were represented. Um, so it's a huge area. And we actually had a family from Australia that came. So they were here vacationing already. It wasn't just because of the museum. Um, we had, uh, we, we determined that 75% of the people visiting the museum were from outside of Peabody. Uh, so only 25% of the vis visitors were from, for, from Peabody. Um, we had 19 different school and camp groups to come uh, and visit, so we set up programs and did uh, special events for those as well during, during the week. Um, and then also we had um, the Northeast Arc, they had the early intervention uh, program. They had four sold out multi-week uh, multi sessions, uh, that was pretty successful. And then we, al we also wanted to judge the, sort of the economic factor, you know, being the economic developer for, for the mayor. Um, how did that affect some of the local businesses? And we, and we talked to uh, some of the businesses right around that. And they, they've seen an increase in sales just around that, people coming in, getting coffee, getting a sandwich, and things like that. So there was, from their perspective, they were happy to see, and they were great neighbors to have, and they were happy to see the museum there. Terrific. And um, as we also talked about before, the, the, uh, the, the, the value of this work is, is measured in, in actual sort of metrics like this, but a lot of times the benefits sort of are sort of out there and they continue to sort of percolate and grow and expand um, in many other different ways as that systems work and the relationships uh, continue to build and create new opportunities, new ideas. Um, and so as a result of that, I'm curious around, curious city here, curious around, um, 
you know, uh, so what does this do beyond this effort? What does this do regarding promoting arts and culture in Peabody beyond this, in continuing to galvanize this, this collaborative effort? Thank you. So as Martha mentioned earlier, that the PCC, one, one of our earlier um, missions was to help really highlight and promote all that we were doing individually. Um, and over the past couple of years, we've really worked together to cross-promote and share each other's stories. So something that the library may be doing that's relevant to the Northeast Dark um, community, we would share that story. And same with the city um, and all the organizations. Um, so over the, you know, over the past few years, we've also been incredibly lucky to have a lot of news stories. We've been, um, had a lot of positive stories in newspapers and on local TV stations. But we've always made sure that when one group is being highlighted and promoted, that other groups are being mentioned as well and brought into the story and, and into the conversation. And that keeps those stories fresh and keeps the news wanting to come back to visit us. Curious City provided a challenge for us. Um, we knew in order to show success, we had to reach a new audience. We had to reach outside of the bounds of people who are interested in um, what was going on in, in Peabody at that moment. And one of the measurements of success was the amount of visitors who came from outside of Peabody to visit. And so we knew we had to be strategic in our advertising and marketing to reach these new audiences. And we coordinated um, kind of a guerrilla marketing campaign where we developed uh, a single image um, using an artist representation. Um, we set uh, specific information we wanted on different posts and in the information, so the time, um, you know, setting the date and the time frames. And then we asked all of our partners and our friends and organizations that aren't sitting with us that we have relationships with to share that um, during a specific time period of the day. So, you know, on a Tuesday morning between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m., share this image with this particular pieces of information and explain why you're excited from your perspective for the development of Curious City. And then link the Curious City social media and the website in, into your story as well. We weren't sure if this was going to work or not, um, and I, we think that the real test of the success of, of this campaign was um, the Library Pass program. And in Massachusetts, and I've learned a lot through this process, that those free passes at the library get uploaded into a, a generalized system and the library, libraries have to you know, check their system and, and pick which passes they're gonna use. About a week prior to the opening of Curious City, we realized that only six libraries had picked up our passes. And you know, we just didn't spend the time to, to contact each and in, um, every group. And we decided to test out our growth in our social media by thanking those six libraries and, and publicly stating that if you want to come to Curious City, here's a free way to do it. And, and we thank those six libraries. Over the next 24 hours, poor Deanne, who was doing our social media, was updating the list to include every library um, in, in Essex County um, for their participation in, in that. So, you know, that just proved that using social media and using our joint networks really helped reach out to, to different communities and new people. What we did to capitalize on that, too, is, is we have robust and active programming happening within the city. You know, 75% of the visitors who came into Curious City came from outside of Peabody. So we used the Curious City program and their social media to also co-market and co-brand other activities that we were doing. You know, the mall was developing some really interactive children's programming throughout the summer, and so we were able to share what they were doing through that media, as well as, you know, each one of us um, doing different programming, um, and, and we're able to share to those new followers um, and visitors coming in uh, to, to Curious City. And then as, as a PB Cultural Collaborative um, with our own marketing and social media, you know, we, we took another step um, forward and to take a look at everything everyone was doing again and coming up with a weekly calendar for our followers. And if you looked, you know, throughout the summer um, when most activities are happening, that multiple times throughout every day of the week, there was some sort of a cultural program happening within the city. And we were able to show people um, and link people out to the different places where they were happening. 
in development of the actual physical place of Curious City, we wanted to be able to connect the cultural programming um, and creativity and learning all together. And that came out about with the, the development of the name Curious City. And that really signified to us how curiosity and creativity are important to early childhood development. We also wanted the museum to pay homage to the city as well. And we developed kind of loose ideas of what we wanted um, to have happening in, in the museum and reached out to the creative um, members and, and people within the community with an RFP, encouraging people to apply um, to help support the, the development of the museum. So each room that we developed had a PCC board member assigned to it, um, but the goal was to bring in people to help bring our concept to fruition. And we were able to hire mo multiple artists and multiple creative groups to help with that process. So one example was um, we wanted a farm to lunch box themed area. Peabody, which is very unique in this area, and I think in the state, um, owns two farms. And we wanted to be able to, to acknowledge um, that uniqueness, but also um, to have a learning and, and creative play area that talked about farming and healthy eating and dieting. And a local artist brought in her network and we were able to hire them to design an entire room based upon um, healthy eating and, and healthy living choices. And then being located at the George Peabody House, we also wanted to recognize his work um, in, in the area um, with his philanthropy. And so we developed a banking um, area, and part of that was also to encourage ch children to start thinking about where would you spend your, your extra money. And we came up with some games and did some daily polls on if you had extra money, where would you put it in. So if you have children, the two top things from my informal is another children's museum or, or a full-time children's museum and puppies. So <laughs> if you don't want puppies, <laughs> talk to us after. <laughs> and knowing that the space um, that we were in was limited in size uh, and that we couldn't really accomplish everything that we wanted to do, we supplemented our programming and our exhibits by hiring artists um, and uh, musicians to be able to do some supplemental programming within there, within the museum. So every week we were able to have um, programming around music and dance, um, arts and mindfulness. And then to recognize some of the history within Peabody as well, um, we brought in some interactive programming to introduce children to shoemaking and, and acknowledging the leather um, history of, of the city as well as basket weaving. One family that we had spoken to um, in a reply to why, you know, the question of why they kept coming back into the museum kind of summed up what we were hoping for during this experience. And the family re um, reported to us that each time they came into the museum, they felt that their children were having an experience and it was just not a playtime. Terrific. <clears throat> and uh, it, it's amazing to me, I mean, being able to participate in these different collaborative efforts, um, the power of one the power of one group, the power of a group of people coming together under one vision and accomplishing something bigger than they could have done alone. And, and I find every time we embark on something like this, it's, it's sort of counterintuitive for a lot of people to say, why would I want to join that? How's that going to help me? What, what's it going to result in for me? And so listening to you, Tim, and the examples that you're talking about, the benefits go so far beyond even just this one project. Benefits to sort of programming at the mall or you know, local farms or artists and art organizations or the myriad of other things you discussed right there all rise together. And so by coming together, you know, you're able to accomplish so much more and the, the ripple effects of that just go on and on and on and on. So that's terrific and uh, inspiring on that front. So since we are so fortunate to have the mayor here um, and we're really thankful for you to make the time and be here with us and uh, demonstrating how important this is as, as part of this collaborative effort and, uh, and, and uh, as part of this, I guess the question we'd have for you now as we, as we come to a close on this conversation is, where does this go from now? What do we do now? What, is this, what does this collaborative do now and what does this mean for Peabody? Yeah. Well, thank you, and I'm very honored to be here this morning uh, for this event. And I do want to thank everybody that's sitting up on this stage. This really was a, a true team effort um, with, I think, everybody contributed in an important way, uh, particularly the ECCF 
and I don't think with every, without anyone's, everyone's contribution, I'm not sure if this project would have happened. I was in a great situation because they did all the work. I got to go and take the pictures and go to the photo ops and take my four children to the museum, which was terrific, and they, had, they really enjoyed it, uh, which was important for me. Uh, but truthfully, our downtown in Peabody has, has struggled. It was just often a cut through to get to Salem or some other communities. And upon becoming mayor, I really felt, and it was, was felt by a whole bunch of people, that was really, there was true potential in our downtown and that we needed to make an effort to make it attractive and to show its potential. We invested over $6 million in putting in new sidewalks, expanding the sidewalks, planting new trees, putting in new lighting, creating open space areas for public events. And the great news was that this was a unanimous vote by the council each and every time. We have our state representative, Tom Walsh, here, who worked very hard to make that a reality because we got some great state funding for the project. But there was a great deal of investment put in place. But we knew to take the next step and really have some excitement and to try to bring some excitement to our downtown, we needed some arts and culture. We had some great restaurants, we had some amazing shops, but for us to take the next step, we needed to invest and try to create some art and culture in our community, in our downtown. The thought for the um, Children's Museum originated with a conversation with Mark Whiting and myself. Um, Mark lives in New Hampshire and he talked about Dover, New Hampshire and its relationship with Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And we, a bunch of us on this stage, went to take a visit of the Children's Museum up in Dover, New Hampshire, and we were all just blown away by what we thought could be something terrific in Peabody. Uh, we set about moving forward on that, taking some baby steps, but really we needed to show the community, because there was some skepticism, if this could really work. And that's why this project was so important for us, to show the community that there's a great deal of interest in the Children's Museum, that Peabody is the right place for it, and the results were terrific and uh, very heartening for so many that invested so much time and effort to make this a reality. Uh, I can tell you right now where we purchased some parcels in Peabody Square, uh, right on Main Street and Washington Street, some parking. Um, right now we're getting some quotes to do the uh, work that we need to, uh, but I fully intend to go to the council in the very near future, within the next few weeks, uh, to seek the funding to take the next step. I'm telling you right now, Peabody is going to have a permanent children's museum in our downtown area. And that's very exciting for me to say. Um, I know there's a great deal of support for it. And again, the numbers were important for us, though, because it will be an investment for us. Um, we will be uh, seeking some funding, but it will be an investment for the city of Peabody. And these numbers back up what all of us on this stage believe could happen. So it's exciting for us. Uh, there's been tremendous support, uh, but the Essex County Community Foundation was critical in making this happen, and we're all for, for very grateful for, their, for your support and your partnership, and uh, hopefully very soon making this a reality for us. And, and, and as ECCF, as representing ECCF, I would say thank you to you all. You all did the work. And, uh, and the, the, the fact that you went from idea to experimentation and pilot to now sort of a future vision of something permanent is exactly what we're trying to look for. So that's tremendous work. And uh, whenever San San speaks, I spend most of my time just taking notes of all her eloquent uh, comments. And she said one thing which I think is embodied here, which was, you know, collective vision, holistic approach. And I think that's exactly what the spirit of this effort here is. And I want to congratulate you all and thank you all for all of your work on that front. This is systems work. This is the real work. Uh, and it's inspiring for all of us to, uh, to see it. And, and thank you all for that. So I think on that note, we'll wrap up this part. And thank you all very much. Thank you all for being here today. <laughs> Sorry you had to carry your own chairs. <laughs> it's good teamwork, I think. <laughs> <It's good. laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Caroline Harvey. Um, I saw her perform in Gloucester a few months ago, and she has prepared a piece for you. So without further ado, here she is. Is this 
going to move? I'm going to move it, yeah. Wouldn't be rock and roll if we didn't move the mic stand. <laughs> you got to tell me if I'm center stage, otherwise I'll be annoyed later. I'm good? All right. My name is Caroline Harvey. I am very, very thrilled to be here. Um, I'm a poet and a performer. Uh, I live with an invisible disability. And it's a job requirement for me as an artist to be dramatic and sensitive, so um, I'll be dramatic with you and say that um, art saved my life. And reading poetry, writing poetry, it gave me everything I have. My livelihood, my partner, uh, my health, my recovery, my community, gave me back my family. So before I share this poem with you, I want to um, just thank you for being here, for doing the work. Um, for preparing to do the next work, and for listening. The title of this poem is a quote from one of my favorite writers and influences. Unquestionably political and irrevocably beautiful, Toni Morrison. Rejoice, rejoice the open yawn of eye, that soft surprise of cheek, praise the lift of chest and that feral snare beat underneath, praise the body that responds to beauty and to sound. The way your skin stirs in concert with paint, pulling at the edge the stretch of canvas. The surge of stain and hue praise the mind that transforms in the expanse of a single line of poetry. How we awaken and are provoked to act and open all in the expanse of a single chapter. Art is how the world and its ghosts cross into us. Art is how we bear witness and evolve and solve and move forward. Surely you've known a poem that wakes the dead, a song that shook the bones of your lost love. Remember the book that raised you up, the novel that asked and answered the questions you were afraid to admit, that first museum, remember? Remember that marble carved with such precision you would have bet your life that it lived? could have nuzzled up to that cool, cool neck and whispered your fear into its ear. Rejoice the hands that made that magic. Praise the grooves and bends of artist palm. Praise the painter who paints what they cannot say, the guitar that speaks when words aren't enough. Praise the maker who makes us see beauty in the ugliest of places, who teaches us to love what we don't understand. In the beginning of everything, of tribe, nation, progress, of culture, there is always art. Art is both foundation and frame. It is the body we live in and the nourishment that sustains us. Thousands and thousands and thousands of decades ago, someone pressed breath through an animal bone and the first instrument was made, a flute. And thousands of decades before that, voices, the rhythmic stomp of feet, rhythms, a rattle to mark the movement of our people, how we kept warm in feathers and fur or came here in boats and tumbled onto the shore. We danced to that fire wherever it burned. 
its crackle and spit, our flail and sweat. Then the clay was crushed, sculpted into vessels, hardening in the sun, stars drawn in the dirt, maps made on stone, minerals muddled and smeared on a rock, a whole language built to track the hunt, to warn of prey, to communicate before and beyond words, to pass the knowledge onward. Someone wrote it all down, told, and sketched, and pigmented, and recorded our legend. Art is dangerous. Art stirs the water and threatens the power and unapologetically keeps the score. Want to dismantle a society? Get rid of the artists. Want to prevent a revolution? Silence the poets. Want to hide the truth and pretty up the war? Burn the books and slash the paintings. They have tried so many times to take the dance out of our bodies, but when they steal the drums, we just build them again. The art we have and the art we make. Someone protected that for us. We sang in the fields while we labored. We sang on the front lines, wrote secret poems in the foxhole, and hiding under the floor in the dark. They tried to make us believe the lie, so we sheltered the truth in charcoal and ink. Maybe it was your great 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 grandmother, brave enough to scratch out the story, or maybe it was your Tia, your Zadie. That girl your brother loved, or maybe it was you, you with your ocean eyes and tender, empathetic mind. Maybe it was you in the rainstorm by candlelight, heeding the rush of pen, the swaddle of brush, your high mountain voice lifting to the sky, the quill swimming in dark ink, the bells and the skins, the pull of creativity as instinctual as a blink. As necessary as breath, art is not a luxury. It's not an extravagance to be admired from afar. It is lifeblood, water, essential, urgent. The path through the forest, the irrigation burrowed under the fertile ground of earth. Art is how we stay alive, long after our bones are wind. Art. Is how we mark the horror, and name the dead, and make manifest the dream we have of a healed and healing world. How we tend to the break and imagine the whole planet renewed. We live in a time when horror is the daily news, and honesty hides away behind funding and pundits. There's a history to the relevance of art, and some years have been kinder than others. So tell me, decades from now, will the children understand how we lived? And not just understand, will they know the texture and taste, the shiver and hum of our shared breath? Because there is fact bent to politics' whim and scholars' favor, and then there is the truth. Living among the people, there is a difference between the name of a color and the pigment growling on a page. There is a person named and aged, and then there is the portrait drawn by the lover who loved them. Art tells the truth because it's not limited by fact. And make no mistake, art will terrify you if you don't want the truth. Art isn't always pretty, but it's always beautiful. The way a storm is both terrifying and awesome. Art is blue sky. Art is hurricane. Art is light in the darkest of rooms, and nothing gets to hide. That's why the musicians were blacklisted and shunned. That's why the poets are starved and imprisoned. Art is beyond money, beyond what can be bought, beyond any brick and mortar wall or locked door you can shut. Art is the preservation of the liberation that lives way, way, way down in the caverns of our souls. I know you're busy. 
I know the phone's ringing probably right now, and you have a meeting to get to, and the car needs fixing, but I need something from you. We need something from each other. So please promise me this. The next time you move past a mural, will you pause to praise the hands that made it? Will you see the sacrifice under the beauty? When your child doodles the wallpaper, give them a pencil and a sheet of paper. Say thank you to the little ones who just know instinctively that moments are worth preserving. When you pick up the phone, think about picking up the paint instead. When you can sing aloud in the car instead of raging at the traffic, when you can listen to the stories that the elders tell at the table, when you see your student or your lover or your new friend leaning into the creative push and pull, remember how you know what you know. Remember the writers and the map makers and the sculptors and the singers and poets and stompers that kept your legends safe. Say, yes, do that. Make that, write that down. That's beautiful. It matters. The world needs you. Say, let me help you. Sit down in the grass and add your mark to the page. Write, I love you in the sand. Build a tower of seashells and spin circles in your bare feet. Slap your thighs when the groove moves you. Be fearless. Be fearless in a world that deifies fear and count yourself. Right now, among the needed, count yourself among the artists, among the creators and witnesses and make of this moment, this one, Make of this moment a sanctuary and resist anything. Resist everything with your whole being. Resist anything that threatens to smother the neon, electric, primal, prerogative, wild right of the artist because without it, without art, all of this, all of it, is gone. Thank you. Wow, sorry, a little distracted there. Whew. Um, so, our last speaker of the morning is David House from Arts Emerson and Emerson College. Uh, I welcome David to the stage. Oh, no. No, 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 no. It'll be right back, I promise. I did this before, earlier today. Made the same mistake. And it'll be right back. I promise. Can I close this? Can I close this? Not all the way. Because it'll shut down the front okay. We can't move it over that way. Nope. Because okay. it will be. Okay. How's that? Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all, and a great pleasure to share these moments with you here in the Cabot Theater for a few moments this morning. It's been a busy year, and um, I rarely have the time to do anything that's not theater, but this spring I had the privilege of watching uh, the Tony Awards, and because my invitation must have gotten lost in the mail, I watched it from the comforts of my own home, but this year was really special. I knew several of the producers and directors who were receiving and presenting awards. In fact, my colleague Ma Mara Isaacs won the Best Musical Award for Hades Town, which was really, really quite special. Yay, Mara. Um, but the moment that has stuck with me all these months later was when Ali Stroker won the best performance 
by a featured actress in a musical for her role in Ado Annie in the revival of Oklahoma. Do you remember what made that moment so remarkable beyond her spectacular performance? It was that Allie is a world-class musical theater actress who happens to use a wheelchair for mobility. No one with a, in a wheelchair had ever won a Tony Award for performing before. In her acceptance speech, she acknowledged the importance of the moment by saying, and I quote, this award is for every person who has a disability or a limitation or a challenge who has been waiting to see themselves in this arena, end quote. Now the TV audience heard that part of the message loud and clear, but I later read that something she had said wasn't broadcast. She had mentioned something in the press room interview that I think more people need to hear. She said, and I quote, the theater houses where all the audiences come in are made accessible, but the backstages are not. I would ask theater owners and producers to really look into how they can make backstages accessible to the performers with the disabilities so that they can get around." End quote. Interesting, right? Well, a few weeks later, I had the privilege of seeing the great image maker, one of our most prolific image makers of our time, artist Carrie Mae Weems, speak, and she offhandedly observed that social justice is trending and I find it both wonderful and problematic. And when I heard that phrase, I thought of Ali Stroker. And those two pioneering women, those two pioneering artists, sparked the thoughts that I want to share with you today about how our pursuit of social justice, diversity, and inclusion in the arts are both wonderful and problematic. Wonderful in that Ali Stroker is now established at the very top of her field inviting a whole new audience to see themselves on the stage. Problematic, the vast majority of workplaces prevent Ali Stroker and others from entering those backstages. It's an apt metaphor for the moment that we are in across the arts and other sectors and communities. Many of us are paying a lot of attention, quite a bit of attention to the external expression of our progressive values, yet we struggle to make the necessary internal changes to support and sustain those values. We need to learn how to use our pride and enthusiasm about what is wonderful and funnel it into greater determination to address that which remains problematic. But let me start with the wonderful, and there are many things that are wonderful. For starters, we are experiencing more work by underrepresented artists. We're seeing more work in our galleries, at our museums, in our concert halls, and in our theaters. Also wonderful is that we're seeing more appointments of people and leaders of color across our disciplines. More artistic directors of color on the, uh, become the, taken on the helms of major institutions across the city. And just this year, four artistic directors of color were appointed to major regional theaters across the country. Quite wonderful. My beloved Museum of Fine Arts in Boston appointed its first black curator in its 150 year history. That was in October of this past year. First black curator. It's been a long time coming, but also quite wonderful. The nonprofit arts sector has witnessed an increased interest in civic engagement, and my sense is that our education and community outreach programs are at an all time high. I hear lots of conversations about diversifying audiences, and it's clear to me that we as organizations are approaching this challenge with rigorous intentionality. Also wonderful. But speaking of community engagement, we are looking critically at the words we use in a wonderful way. We are recognizing the paternalistic nature in words like community engagement and relevance and outreach. We understand that diversity only means variety that you can measure. And that's not the same as inclusion, which is more about active participation. We see the word equity appearing in the titles of conferences, plenary sessions, and breakout sessions all across the country, state level and local level and the regional level. And while it isn't always clearly understood, we have the sense that our standards are getting higher. There are levels to aspire to. 
I like to think of it in this way. Diversity is like receiving an invitation to the party. Inclusion is being invited to dance. And equity is all about fairness, being able to have the power to plan the party and invite people to the party. So more of us are seeing distinctions and definitions that used to be blurry. More of us are paying attention to the external expression of these values, the browning of our programming, appointments of people of color in key leadership positions, and our espoused language. We are paying attention to those things that we can count and we can quantify, the diversity of our staff, the diversity of our audience, the number of outreach programs or engagement programs we're doing in our organization. All of this matters. This is all progress that we should be incredibly proud of, and we should celebrate the good intentions of the artists and the organizations to right the wrongs of the past. It truly is wonderful. So now I want you to hold on to that thought, and now hold on to the other thought in your head simultaneously. It's problematic, and both things can be true at the same time. This important progress shines an even brighter light on the deep internal work that is necessary for true change to happen. As a field, we've learned to use the language to communicate our deeply held values, but what does it mean when the system and culture in which we are operating are not keeping pace with the language and the espoused values? Take for me, for instance. I happen to be one of the three black executive leaders leading a large, non-culturally specific theater in the country. And I don't say this as a moment of pride, but I say it to remind us that we have much more work to do. As we tackle the issues of diversity in our audiences, we should double down on our efforts to reflect diversity in our organizations, in our staff, our boards, and equally important, in our donors. As we think about diverse audiences, we are invited to the work that is curated, funded only by white men who often profit from it, it's problematic. Addressing that disparity requires more work, out-of-the-box thinking, and perhaps more resources, even while we continue the wonderful work we're doing together. And diversity of staffing is wonderful as it is, is still not enough if institutions' culture is not inclusive and equitable. We can adopt visible structures and practices from books and blog posts. We can put our carefully worded espoused language on our conference room walls. But if the core, at the core of our culture are unconscious beliefs, perceptions, and thoughts, and feelings, the ultimate source of our values and our actions. As Edgar Schein, one of the leading thinkers of organizational culture, puts it, and I quote, culture exists in the abstract, hard to measure and count, but the forces that it creates are powerful. And if we don't understand the operation of these forces, we become victim to them. Our cultures are still victimizing too many people. And it's problematic that the unconscious bias and perceptions of coworkers and leaders make our organizations intolerable for so many talented people of color and women. To interrogate those beliefs requires an intense internal inquiry. And my sense is that we underestimate the amount of rigor, resource, and research that we need to allocate to that work. So I've talked about problematic hiring and problematic culture. The third and perhaps the most uncomfortable thing we need to look at directly is how money moves in our ecosystem. And I'm assuming that we all agree that the funding community is an important part of the arts and culture sector. Research on foundation giving paints a picture that bears questioning. Of every foundation dollar, 11 cents goes to the arts. Of that 11 cents, 5 cents goes to the arts organizations with budgets of more than $5 million. That represents 2% 2, 2 of all our arts organizations. And then 1, 1 cent goes to the arts organizations serving underrepresented communities. And less than half a cent goes to arts organizations focused on social justice work. These statistics are disheartening. Many of the resources aimed at supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts are going to the largest, widest institution. And yes, maybe it's that they have more work to be done in that area, but it's problematic that we are effectively overlooking culturally specific organizations who've been doing this work for decades. And what about the privilege of our beloved individual donors, and we love them all, 
I wonder if we are operating under an, under an outdated model. The model of he or she who owns a purse owns a culture. I think we can do better. To sum it up, it seems that where there are good intentions, problematic consequences won't be far behind. When we accommodate elements of change, but allow self-congratulation to prevent us from addressing the structure that is actually the source of injustice, we are effectively putting a fresh, paint, a fresh coat of paint on an already unstable structure. But is that the future that we want? Or can we build a future where we align external expressions of values with our internal commitment to change? When we align the language with behaviors and when we align our intentions with impact. We have the opportunity to reimagine how power and privilege show up in our organizations. We have the power to reimagine how relationships relate to each other, to re even reimagine what a donor looks like. At the end of the day, we not only need the fresh paint, but we need to rebuild or restore the structure. I get it, it's overwhelming to think that all the work that we've done and it, consider it merely superficial. But let me share some experiences of my own institution and how I remain optimistic, even as I am realistic about the work and the long road that we have ahead. Four years ago, I joined the team of Arts Emerson and I was thrilled with the fresh coat of paint. The programming and the language hit the spot. We consider ourselves Boston's leading presenter of contemporary world theater dedicated to connecting communities through stories that deepen and reveal our connection to each other. We made a commitment to being part of a civic-wide effort to foster civic transformation around race through the arts. It's wonderful, right? But I soon learned that our, the ways that we were operating were awfully deeply in conflict with our behaviors. When I pulled back the curtain and took a look at our production team, what I saw was mostly white men. And let me be clear, we have a fantastic production team. But in that moment, I realized it wasn't enough to talk about diversity and inclusion in front of the curtain if we hadn't tackled those issues behind the curtain with our own team. Now, it's important to note that Arts Emerson, we're a young organization. We celebrate 10 years, opening up our 10th season just on Wednesday evening. And, but we started at scale with the charge of activating seven theaters in Boston's downtown theater district. It's important to note that we didn't have a legacy donor base, we didn't have a legacy audience, and we didn't have a board. We report directly to the president of the college. And so herein lies our opportunity to do things a little differently, to push the boundaries and test new approaches. So we embarked upon a journey, a journey of understanding our culture, and of transforming it into help us become a more inclusive and a more equitable organization. And I wanna share three things that we've learned on this journey. One is to inspire a culture of curiosity. The second thing is to be unapologetic about our values. And the third is to learn bilaterally. First, we learn to inspire a culture of curiosity with a focus on inquiry and learning. Some organizations see diversity training as a transaction, a box to check. But we see training and learning on a continuum, an ongoing process which engages the entire team. We started our learning journey about four years ago with a session on unconscious bias, which seemed to me an easier entry point for many who, as our team was, new to the conversation of diversity, equity, and inclusion. That particular training four years ago laid the foundation for more and more complicated trainings to come. Transgender training, accessibility training, and recently we all participated in the undoing racism training. One that's not for the faint of heart. Had we started there four, four years ago, the team may have rejected it. But over our four year journey, our team had developed the muscle to learn together we were able to hear the lessons and of the learning and training and apply them to our individual and collective lives. And it's transformed the way that we see each other in the organization and it's transformed the way that we work together. It's like building blocks and the training and the learning continues. 
Secondly, we aim to be unapologetic about the values that we are driving toward. You know the phrase that people love change as long as it doesn't happen to them. In other words, not everyone that talks about values is excited about operationalizing those values. As much as we want to love and embrace the change that we seek, we had, we've had to bless and release a few along the way. Some skeptical funders, misaligned partners, frustrated audience members, and some culturally misfitting staff members. Now the goal has never been to lose people along the way, but we understand that not everyone seeks change in the same way. I'm remembering the donor who supported the idea of building diverse audiences, but frowned upon us and our efforts to present work that represented those diverse audiences. Calling projects out of Cambodia and Chile and South Africa and even Boston social projects. Her attempt to use her privilege and access to further her own, own agenda rather than support ours is something that we see showing up in organizations over and over again. Needless to say, we lost that donor, but we understand that when one door closes, another door opens. The values come first, or change will never happen. What would it be if we, our philanthropic practices mirrored our deeply held values around equity. And you can ask me about our Black Philanthropist Initiative later. But what would it look like if our donors use their privilege to question and hold organizations accountable to our deeply held values? I'm inspired by Aggie Gunn's use of her privilege to bring attention to the injustice system, to the injustice in our justice system by selling her Liechtenstein to start a criminal, criminal justice fund. Now, perhaps we don't have Liechtenstein to sell, but Perhaps we, there are things that we do have that we can give up. I've also been inspired by the unusual and radical acts of Chris Bradford, the director of the Baltimore Museum of Art, and his commitment to selling or deaccessioning uh, uh, de works to build an acquisition fund for contemporary works by women and artists of color. A radical act, but that museum is making space for change to happen. What else must we give up? so that change can happen. Finally, we are appreciating the benefits of bilateral learning. So often we position ourselves as having something that we believe the, company, the community needs, and we begin to build programming around our own ideas of those needs. Again, with good intentions, we at Arts Emerson were programming signers for various um, shows with little regard to what our deaf patrons wanted and needed from us. In fact, we had ve done very little to engage the deaf community. But fortunately, one of our deaf patrons approached and asked if she could intervene to offer some advice, and we listened. Now we sit with our ever-growing deaf community of patrons to hear directly from them which shows they're interested in, and we seek their guidance on how best to engage their community. We're, listening to, we're learning to listen better and deeper to all of our constituents. So the journey that we're on is far from over, but there's wonderful progress. We have one of the most diverse production teams in the city now, and many speak about Arts Emerson as being countercultural. but humbly I like to believe that we are part of a new normal movement, and perhaps many of the practices that we have tested over the years will become more commonplace. The work is hard, but the reward is great. So let me end by saying this, that with all that is wonderful and in spite of all that is problematic, I am hopeful about the future of arts and cultural organizations. Yes, there are mornings when I wake up and I wonder if all the talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion serves as a kind of cover for the actual practices that continue to reproduce differential outcomes for those who have traditionally felt unwelcomed in our institutions. But that sense of hopelessness, hopelessness is a dangerous proposition. For me, the work is personal, and I truly don't believe that I have the privilege of pessimism. I believe in things that I have not seen, and I actually believe that we can create organizations where people are less burdened by our history of exclusion and inequity. I believe that artists and arts leaders are eager to right the wrongs of the past, and I believe that we are on a journey towards something remarkable, something transformative, and something wholly wonderful. 
We, the black, the Latinx, the Asian, the native, and the white, the disabled, the abled body, the queer, the gay, the transgender, we all want to be seen. We want to be heard and we want to belong. Maya Angelou once said, and I quote, in my work and in everything I do, I mean to say that we as humans are more alike than we are unalike. And to use that statement to break down the walls that we put between ourselves because we are different. The arts have the power to break down those walls. And each one of us in this room, each one of us with our resources, our connections, and our curiosity, each one of us has the power to leave this world a little better than we found it. More civil, more just, and more connected. And so in pursuit of what might be our shared ideals of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I hope that we will commit fully to this journey so that the problematic can be consistently outweighed by the wonderful. I hope that we'll commit to expanding the definition of artistic excellence, honoring the form, rich forms of cultural expression held by different communities, and presenting underrepresented and undervalued artists, not only because it is good, but because it is right. I hope that we'll commit to making space for the traditional patron as we embrace those who have felt unwelcome for so many years. May we commit to assembling boards, staffs, and donors who reflect the communities in which we do our work. And may we commit to reimagining the relationships inside the ecosystem, organization to community, community to artists, and donor to grantee. Everyone in this room can take real steps toward a better world. And maybe within our lifetime, an artist like Ali Stroker will wheel her way with ease onto the, into the lobbies and the backstages of our theaters, into the galleries of our museums and the halls of our concerts and orchestras, and proclaim with sincere truth, we have arrived. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And I want everybody to make note of a date um, because we, come on out. <laughs> we, ha we have a date with David Howes set for, uh, for all of us to learn more about how we can use some of these principles and incorporate them into the work we do. February 13th, we'll be having a workshop uh, on this with David and helping to present some of these issues to you uh, on a more granular level here in Essex County. I'm not sure where it's going to be yet, but February 13th is the date. So. <laughs> and now, I would like to wrap up the morning session um, by welcoming our Native American Awareness Group. The Massachusetts Native American Awareness Association is based here in Danvers. And uh, we've been working with them, as we said before, on their powwows for this period of time. And they're going to round out the day for us um, and transition us to our lunch over at Dane Street Church. So without further ado.
And now the group invites you to get up and on your way out the door. We're going to be leaving through that side door, but before we do, there's another dance and you're invited to join in.